mientras todos los otros links son hijas. Y también hijas va a mencionarle a Tani en su, en su charla de Tani de Suelos, una Tani Tani.
normal la cosa. Es que lo que estoy pensando es que si se van a parar en el podio. This is two minutes remaining of your nine, and this is <coughs> zero minutes remaining, okay? Um, you also have, if you wish, to use a pointer. You don't have to use this. So it's not quite up to uh, Fusion yet, but um, you may use this. The one thing is, is that it has a, um, a on and off switch in the end of it here, so it's permanently on unless you flick it off, okay? And if you drop it, um, you'll see a much, um, the rainy can, um, can see things. Also, just uh, a quick um, point out, shout out, this is Irene, she's responsible for um, putting this on Facebook Live. Um, I will, um, or somebody, did you send it just to me, the link just to me? Uh-huh. Okay. I will send that um, to you students so you can send that to family and friends so they can watch. Um, the other person um, important to know is Joyce Leton, who's in the back of the room, who will be doing the simultaneous translation. Um, Evelyn in the door there is helping in all kinds of ways. Uh, we have some guests. And um, other than that, I think we're ready to go. For those of you who don't know about this program, this is the... Monteverdi Institute, UC EAP, Tropical Biology and Conservation Program. Students applied to be in this program about a year ago um, and have been working and thinking about what independent projects that they would do. And our first session um, is a group of folks who elected to go to the coast to study things in the ocean. For those of you who don't know, um, Costa Rica has basically about 500,000 um, hectares of ocean under its domain, but by contrast, 50,000 um, square kilometers of, um, of area, um, it's 500,000 um, square kilometers, excuse me. Anyway, these folks um, got intrigued by things in the ocean, and they'll be telling us about their projects today. And our first speaker is Emma Cardoza, who will be talking about um, <laughs> bioluminescence. Good morning! Uh, so my name is Emma Cardoso and the title of my project is A Sea of Stars, How Changing Environmental Conditions Affects Bioluminescent Dinoflagellates' Ability to Produce Light. And to start, I'm going to go way back to the beginning of this program where we went on a field trip to Costa Rica's beautiful coast at Coquini Field. And while we were there, we actually had the amazing opportunity to go night snorkeling. And when I tell you that this was one of the coolest experiences of my entire life, I truly mean that. I felt like I was an intergalactic mermaid, okay? <laughs> I felt like I was swimming through space, hence the title, A Sea of Stars, and that is because of these things called bioluminescent dinoflagellates. So bioluminescence is the production and emission of light by a living organism as a result of a biochemical reaction. 
That reaction involves luciferin, which is a substrate, and luciferase, which is the enzyme. And then dinoflagellates are these really tiny single cell organisms. Um, they are a type of marine plankton. As you can see, you can only see them through a microscope. So while you're splashing around in the ocean, you don't see anything other than just flickers of light. And this reaction that emits light is actually motion evoked. So like as you can see, like the waves are moving your hands around and swimming. Everything was like lighting up and glowing. And I was just so entranced by this and quite bummed because I was like, why do we not have this in California? Like, I want to swim in the stars in California. And that got me wondering, is it because the ocean's too cold or not humid enough? And down the rabbit hole of thought, I ended up coming up with my question, which is, how does changing environmental conditions affect bioluminescent dinoflagellates' ability to bioluminesce? So to do this, I first had to get my little organisms. So every single day for five different days, between the times of 6 and 7.30 p.m., we would go out on the boat to a specific location. And then I would chuck this little plankton net 10 feet off the boat, and I would reel it in. And as you can see, there's that little collection vial at the end. It holds 50 milliliters of water, so I would take out my sample water and then transfer it into a sample jar. I did this for 10 different samples um, every time that I went out. Once I was done collecting, I went back and got off the boat and started my observation. So I went into a completely pitch black room, waited five minutes for my eyes to adjust, and then I would shake each individual sample jar um, to make it motion activated, and then I would rate the brightness of each jar on a scale from zero to five. Zero being no light at all, five being enough light to illuminate my face. However, most jars ended up having between zero to three, three being enough to illuminate my hand. Once I did this, it was time for the fun part, the experimentation. So the variables that I decided to play with were pH, so I decreased the pH by adding three drops of vinegar, increasing salinity, which I did by adding 0.5 grams of salt, decreasing temperature by putting it in the fridge, increasing temperature by putting it in a bucket of warm water, and then increasing nutrients by putting three grams of cow poop in there. Shout out to Sophie for getting cow poop for me. Um, and then also simulating extra oxygen by putting an aerator in there so it would make some bubbles and hopefully produce oxygen. I chose all these variables because all these variables have an effect on the chemical reaction. So then once I did this, I would let them sit for an hour, and then after an hour, I would go back into the dark room, shake them up again, and see how the brightness was affected through that same rating system as before. Now, I did this five different days, and then I averaged the initial brightness and averaged the final brightness for all of my different manipulation types, as you can see here. And as you can see, the trend tends to be that the manipulations did have an effect on the bioluminescence ability to produce light. So once I had this, I went ahead and I went and found the average change between initial and final for each uh, manipulation type, as you can see here. Here is the negative average change in brightness after subjecting the samples to the given manipulation for one hour. Now that I had this, I wanted to see what was statistically significant in having an effect on the cytoflagellate's ability to produce light. So I used an ANOVA and um, ad hooky tukey test, and I found that of the manipulations, decreasing the pH, increasing the temperature, increasing nutrients, and increasing oxygen had a significant effect on decreasing the dinoflagellate's ability to emit light, whereas decreasing temperature and increasing salinity did not. Now, why is this important? While the adaptive significance of why dinoflagellates emit light has not come to a definite conclusion, there are some hypotheses that it is for defense. For instance, that they will light up to startle the predator so that they can get away, or by illuminating, they're illuminating the predator, so a predator of that one can come, acting as a burglar alarm type of system. Um, additionally, they are uh, phytoplankton, so they provide oxygen and nutrients to the environment, um, to the marine environment, which is important for that ecosystem. But also, if they are subjected to bad conditions, such as a lot of excess nutrients, intense light, and intense temperatures, they'll actually have algae blooms. And dinoflagellate bioluminescence have toxic algae blooms. So this is toxic to the fish as well as humans in the environment. And then finally, this is just one of, in my opinion, one of the coolest natural phenomenons. And so it does generate a lot of 
tourism and ecotourism, which is important. So there are a lot of reasons why maintaining these dinoflagellates is important. However, decreased pH, increased temperature, excess nutrients, and excess oxygen was not favorable for these little guys. And with climate change happening, this is kind of concerning because we are going to see a decrease in pH as ocean acidification happens. And ocean temperatures are rising as a result of global warming. Additionally, there are more extreme weather events, which means that there's going to be more rain and serious storms. And this is gonna cause a lot of excess nutrients to go into the ocean. Now this is concerning because the data showed that the bioluminescent dinoflagellates are not fans of these conditions as they were not as bright. Um, as you can see here, I just want to point out again, in terms of warm temperature, when I increased the temperature by three degrees, not only did it reduce their ability to emit light, but they actually did not luminesce at all. They went completely to zero. And as ocean temperatures are warming, the future of these little diamond flagellates is in question, and that can be concerning um, for their survival, the ecosystem, as well as tourism. Now, in terms of excess oxygen, oxygen is important in both the uh, production of light, as it's vital to the luciferin luciferase reaction, as well as they do produce light as phytoplankton. Um, one of the reasons why I think that the oxygen one did show a decrease in bioluminescence was because I think the turbulence of the aerator actually killed them um, in that small bio. It was, the bubbles were pretty intense. Um, so I do think that that might have had an effect. Additionally, it's important to note that I looked at the decrease in brightness from before and after the manipulations. However, it's hard to tell if these variables actually had an effect on the chemical reaction and decreased the ability to emit light or if it actually killed the dinoflagellates and that decrease in brightness was due to a decrease in abundance of living organisms. Um, however, regardless, it still decreased the light emission, which will still have the effects I've stated before. But if I were to do this in the future, I would potentially take samples before um, from each sample, look under a microscope and extrapolate the abundance of living organisms, and then do this again after um, and see how many of those organisms are actually alive and moving versus dead. Additionally, if I were to do this again, I would increase the time length that I was doing this. For instance, I only did one hour. However, as climate change happens and ocean conditions are altering and these variables are going to alter in this way, the dinoflagellates are going to be exposed to these conditions for a lot longer than an hour. So I would be really interested at extending this time period to see how the dinoflagellates respond to these environmental conditions over a long period of time to kind of simulate what will happen during climate change. So in conclusion, decreasing pH, increasing temperature, increasing nutrients, and increasing oxygen negatively affected the bioluminescent dinoflagellates' ability to emit and produce light. Here are my acknowledgments, my work cited, and thank you guys so much. Time for a few questions. Yes, Brooke. I'm just curious on like what the value was for the ones that you found were significant. Were they like super significant or were they like on the border? Like they were quite like significant. Like yeah. So when I did my statistical analysis, they were all like significantly lower than 0 0.05 by like a couple of decimal points in some of them. Like the warm temperature and the increasing nutrients, especially. Yes, Pat. I just want to compliment you on your use of metaphors. I thought you were very good at relating what you were talking about to common experience, and I, I wanted to point that out. Thank you. Lynn. Um, just to, like, a quick clarification question. So you measure the brightness just with your eyes, not measure the brightness? Yeah. Okay. Just by how many um, spots lit up. Oh, how many spots lit up. Dizzy. Um, how much was the water temperature decrease for the cold? So it went to about 19 degrees Celsius versus like 27 degrees Celsius, which was pretty cold. It was like not what I wanted. However, um, that was the warmest that the refrigerator got. So <laughs> that's what I was working with. I have one fast question. Yeah. Um, how difficult is it to go out and get um, bioluminescence and test them? Because um, in the ideal world, somebody would do this every week or every day for the whole year. Yeah, so um, 
the plankton net was really helpful. I tried getting them just like putting a jar of water in, in uh, putting a jar in water and closing it. Um, did not work as well as the plankton net. So I would definitely recommend having a plankton net if you are going to do this. And I found that my results were best when collecting at night and doing my manipulations at night as well. So I had some pretty long nights. Um, I played around with trying to collect them during the day because they are present during the day and I would try to keep them alive until night. However, I really struggled with that. But people have done it in the past, so it is possible. But for me, I found my best results and that they were still most alive, happy, and active. And most effective results happened right after I collected them when they were still fresh. Thank you, Amy. studied um, certainly by EAP students before. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Isabel and uh, my project was on biofluorescence in marine animals. So first, what is biofluorescence? And um, this is actually different from bioluminescence, which is what Emmy just talked about. Um, because biofluorescent marine animals do not produce their own light and there's no chemical reaction that takes place in this process. So instead, um, biofluorescent marine animals actually absorb light and re-emit it at, um, uh, in a different color, which is driven by pigments that convert shorter length wavelengths of light into longer wavelengths of light. So this is a diagram I created to kind of visualize this. Um, and light sources of short wavelengths of light could be a UV flashlight or even things like the sun and the moon. And um, the sun and the moon actually release white light. Um, so you may wonder why um, they may be able to cause fluorescence in marine animals. And that's because as white, white light penetrates into the ocean, um, all of the shorter wavelengths of light or the um, longer wavelengths of light are absorbed by the water. Um, so the red, the orange, the yellow, everything um, is absorbed by the water, and then blue is the light that penetrates furthest into the ocean. Um, so this may be why um, the sun and the moon would also be able to illuminate um, biofluorescent animals. Yeah. Okay, so what is known about biofluorescence before I did my study? Um, first, a lot of corals biofluoresce, including um, Sclerotinia coral. Um, there are also more than 180 species of biofluorescent fish, um, and I'll refer back to this paper um, a couple times throughout my presentation, but there's a study done on these 180 fish um, in 2014. And then also, um, more recently, it was discovered that hawksbill and loggerhead sea turtles are also biofluorescent. Okay. So we know about all these biofluorescent marine animals, but there is a lot of debate on what the adaptive significance of this phenom phenomenon may be. So that led me to my question of why are some marine organisms biofluorescent while others are not? Um, and I looked at both coral and other biofluorescent marine organisms, um, and I looked at the relationship between biofluorescence in coral and symbiosis with um, Susan Thelly, which is an algae that has a symbiotic relationship with coral um, that does photosynthesis for the coral. And then I also looked at diamond versus nocturnal um, species in uh, mobile marine animals and whether they biofluoresce or not. And then I also looked at the coloration and patterning in uh, all of the different biofluorescent organisms that I observed. <laughs> Okay, so for my materials and methods, I um, did all my data collection in the Gulf of Santa Elena at three different sites, so um, two coral reef sites and one rocky reef, um, and I did 30 meter transects at all of these sites um, during the day and night, and what I did was I 
placed orange rocks um, at both ends of the transects during the day, and then I went back to these rocks at night to try to, um, to make it easier to find the same location at night. And then at night, I took with me um, two flashlights, <laughs> one white light, um, dive light, and then one UV light, so, um, and then also a camera. So I snorkeled as I was carrying all these things, and um, as, so I was scanning the ocean floor with my um, white light, and then if I identified an, organ, an organism of interest, I would actually dive down to the organ, is an organism of interest, and then I would turn off my white light, turn on my UV light, and then see if the organism fluoresced or not. Um, and this was hard to do sometimes because fish and other things would move. <laughs> it was a lot easier for coral. But um, yeah, so, um, and then I would record these, this on my camera. I would record the organisms both with the UV light and with the white light. Okay. So for my results, first, um, coral. So I observed four genera of biofluorescent coral and one genera of non-biofluorescent coral. And what was interesting about these results is that um, the, four the four genera of biofluorescent coral actually also have a symbiotic relationship with Susan Thelly. And the one non-biofluorescent genus does not have a symbiotic relationship with Susan Thelly. Um, and then in these images, you can see on the left, these are pictures of the coral with the white light, and then these are pictures of the coral with the UV light. So all of these species of coral are biofluorescent. Okay, so this is a video of biofluorescent um, Pasilopora coral. So are both colors? I'm sorry, she's <laughs> Um, and then for mobile marine animals, I actually found that 12 um, biofluorescent, there were 12 biofluorescent species out of 30 species that I observed. Um, and this included seven fish, three crustaceans, um, one nudibranch, and also I found two biofluorescent hawksbill sea turtles, which was probably the coolest part. Um, and you can see some of these in this image also, the same thing, the white light is on the left, the UV light is on the right. And one thing that's really um, interesting to note in these images is that all of these um, marine organisms have very different patterns of biofluorescence. So I'll talk more about that later, but take a look. Okay, and this is a video of the biofluorescent hawksbill sea turtle. And it's really hard to see um, because Stephen, who was taking this video, was not able to get like super close to see the um, fluorescence under the light super clearly, but you could tell that in the shell and in the fins and in the head that this turtle biofluorescent. <laughs> okay, and so then one relationship I looked at was the relationship between biofluorescence in diurnal and nocturnal species. So um, I actually did find a, significance, um, uh, a significant difference. Um, so the, there were significantly more biofluorescent species that were nocturnal than were diurnal. Um, and this is interesting because it may um, suggest that Biofluorescence could have an adaptive significance for species that are more active at night, um, possibly because it allows them to see easier at night. Um, and there are a few hypotheses for this, so that's what we'll talk about next. So yeah, so why do these organisms biofluoresce? Um, here are three hypotheses for this, and these are the ones that I'll be focusing on, although there, there are some more. Um, the first one is uh, photosynthesis enhancement and photoprotection in coral. So past studies have shown that um, fluorescent pigments um, may contribute to light regulation in coral, um, for, specifically for the zooxanthellae that are symbiotic with coral. Um, so yeah, so past studies have shown that fluorescent um, pigments can be located both above or below the zooxanthellae in coral, and this may determine what their um, Role is in actually protecting the coral. So if they're below the coral, it is thought that maybe the um, biofluorescent pigments can convert the blue wavelengths of light into light that can be used for photosynthesis when um, the zooxanthellae don't have enough white light to do photosynthesis. Or if they're placed above the coral or above the zooxanthellae, then this could be a source of um, kind of like a sunscreen for the zooxanthellae um, because the fluorescent pigments can actually reflect light away from the zooxanthellae when the light intensity is too high. 
Um, so these are two examples of biofluorescent coral that I found that also have a symbiotic relationship with Susan Pelley. Okay, so uh, the second hypothesis for um, biofluorescence in marine animals is camouflage. Um, and just as regular coloration often serves as um, uh, camouflage in many animals, um, it has been hypothesized that fluorescent coloration may also serve as camouflage. So this is one um, from the 180 species of biofluorescent fish study. Um, and this is a scorpion fish that, as you can see, um, it's red biofluorescent. And it is camouflaging with this red biofluorescent coral um, that it is inhabiting. Um, and so I didn't see, uh, I didn't have any photos of camouflage specifically from my own observations. Um, I don't know, I may not have just, just may not have been able to um, observe long enough to be able to find examples of this. But um, under white light, this columnus crab may mimics the reef surrounding it. Um, and it is thought that this pattern may carry over when exposed to blue light because um, the crab exhibits green fluorescence similar to the color of the coral that it inhabits. Okay, and then lastly um, is the theory of species recognition. So this hypothesis is supported by past studies which have shown uh, very specific patterns of fluorescence within species um, that are very different from patterns of fluorescence in different species. So two examples of this that I found are the tinsel squirrelfish and the big scaled goatfish. So as you can see in the tinsel squirrelfish, its whole body and its fins were all very biofluorescent. This is the most biofluorescent fish that I found. And then in the big scale goatfish, only its fins were biofluorescent. So this may say something about um, how species um, may, uh, this biofluorescence in these species may allow species to recognize each other at night, um, maybe for communication or for mating, or even recognize each other or other fish that are predators. Okay, so um, thank you to everyone who helped me with this. And any questions? <laughs>
next speaker from UC Santa Barbara is Jordan Sibley, and she will be talking about a um, fascinating little fish called two lemons. is shelter hold preference of two blennies in the Santa Elena Gulf. Okay, so my study subject was this family of fish called Canopsidae, Ken <laughs> also known as two blennies. They're this interesting fish um, found in the tropics and along the Pacific central coast there's 11 genera composing, composed of 38 species. They're really interesting because they spend most of their life within a tube. And <laughs> some of those tubes can be like vacant barnacles, um, mollusk shells, and pol or worm tubes. Um, so essentially they're almost like a sessile organism because they don't really swim around a lot and stay in their tube for most of their adult life. Um, these tubes are really important to them as they provide protection from predators, the elements, and serve as sites to lay eggs. Um, since they are so reliant on their tube, it makes them a really interesting study subject when um, looking at competition and spatial distribution. So I wanted to look into this more, which led to my question, do two blennies have a preference for shelters on a horizontal versus a vertical surface? And then I also um, looked at their distribution and um, wanted to see if there's patterns of aggregation. Okay, so my study site was Bajo Rojo, which is a rocky reef off the coast of um, Kuhimikil. And then that star is mostly where I did my project. And then while at Bajo Rojo, these were some of the species I observed most frequently, of which Acanthem blen Maria Hancocki, <laughs> also known as Hancock's blenny, was by far the most common. Um, studies had shown that on a transect, these other two species were shown in the dozens, while Hancock's blenny was shown in the 100s. So they were by far the most common one at the site. Um, they're also interesting because they're sexually dimorphic with the males being a darker green or black and the females or non-breeding males being a lighter green. And I observed them, um, majority of them um, living inside this barnacle, tetraclytostalactifera. <laughs> okay, while doing a survey of the reef, I also took measurements of the natural holes the blennies were living in. Um, then got a diameter and a depth, and then using those measurements, I modeled my own experimental holes, which I picked the same depth of 30 millimeters, but two different diameters, one smaller at 5.4 millimeters, and one larger at 7.2 millimeters. And then I went ahead and created these three <laughs> experimental blocks by drilling into sandstone rocks on a horizontal and a vertical surface. So for block one and two, I did a total of 30 holes on each side. And then for the third one, I did slightly less, but 15 on each side. And each hole um, is roughly four centimeters away from each other. And it alternates um, the 5.4 and then the 7.2 to get like an even distribution across the block. Then I went ahead and carefully, with help, <laughs> placed these blocks um, on the reef around active blenny sites. Um, and within three depths, but they were all within like the same range of like blenny activities. The depth wasn't like super significant. And then each day after I placed the block, I would return to the site and take data on if any blennies were occupying the holes and then also like the species and the sex if I could. So here are some photos of the blennies in the rocks. They really liked going in them. It was really fun to observe them in the rocks. It was a lot. It was like fun to, um, it was a really easy way to observe their behavior because it was really nice and clear. And then, yeah, there's me posing with the rock. <laughs> okay, and then I um, took data 
data up until December 2nd. So for block one, I got like six or seven days of data. And then for block two and three, I only got three. But in total, I observed 129 blennies, of which 95% were the Hancock's blenny. And within that, only six being male, the rest being female or non-breeding male. Um, and then, yeah, the other 5% were this one other species, the Hypo Bellenius brevipinus. <laughs> um, so then for each individual block, I did a t-test to compare the horizontal and the vertical sides. And for block one, I found they're statistically more on the horizontal or the top side. For block two, more on the vertical. And then block three, there was no statistical difference between the two. Even though each day there was more on the horizontal, but I think that was due to a low sample size. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> and then here's just a graph because of the proportions like proportion of occupied holes because I wanted to like compare the three blocks even though the third block had less holes available. And you can see that even though it looks a little bit different, there was the statistical test showed that there's now a significant significant difference really between the proportion um, except for the horizontal of block two and then the horizontal of block three. And then in terms of their distribution, um, I went ahead and for over the three concurrent data collection days, I counted up all of the occupied holes on either the edge or like the edge adjacent or in the center. And then I found that the majority of the blennies were in locations along the edge versus the center. You can see it really clearly right here with only one not being occupied along this front edge. And then I also want to see if maybe there's like patterns of aggregation across the block. So I created these four categories based on the distance from one fish to another. So close neighbors, which is the one in red, is within four centimeters. Then spread neighbors, which is eight centimeters. Hermits from eight to 12 centimeters. And then loner hermits, which is <laughs> if they were further than 12 centimeters away. And as you can see, like the majority of them were in holes within four centimeters of another fish. Um, you can see it pretty clearly here with like aggregation patterns kind of on the two corners. Okay, and then also just to see if they had a preference for the 7.2 or the 5.4 diameter holes, um, I ran this t-test and it showed that they had a slight preference for the larger of the two diameters. Okay, so as to be expected, Hancock's blending was the most abundant. Um, and the only other species was the Hypoblenius brevipinus. <laughs> um, the reason I think this is was A, they're really, they're super abundant in the site, and also the three blocks were within their habitat range of one to five meters deep while some of the other species that I observed had a wider range of um, habitats they could live in. So I also think like the blocks were kind of in a good position for this species. And then of the Hancock's blending, the majority were female, which I think can be explained that male, it's been shown that males have a higher, um, is it higher reproductive success if they stay in their shelter for longer, because it can kind of show that they're like a dominant male that like, can protect their shelter. So I don't think it would be advantageous for them to occupy these um, experimental blocks after only like a few days. So that's why I think the majority are female. And then in terms of orientation, there is no one clear orientation they prefer, um, which makes me believe that there are other driving factors when it comes into selecting a habitat, um, of which I think the direction of the current and also distance from other available holes might be more important. And then in terms of the preference of the bigger ones that disagreed with a previous EAP study, um, which showed when given the five, like a 5.3 or a 6.8, they preferred the smaller. But I'm also thinking that maybe that the like five to seven millimeter range is just like what they prefer. And I think that maybe 
that more in the 7.2 might have just been a random chance. And then, <laughs> um, in terms of distribution, they seem to prefer the edge, which I believe has to do with the ideal free distribution theory, in that they picked the um, holes on the edge because it is the best spot for them to get food, because um, they eat um, flank tuberous cocoa bond, cocoa bond? <laughs> so I think being on the edge gives them an advantage to like get their prey first if you can compare it to the middle. And then it also, my data also showed that they like to be in clusters. However, since being on the edge and also kind of being in a cluster has some overlap, I can't distinctively say if they have affinity for the edge, each other, or both. Okay, <laughs> I had a really great time doing this project. It was super interesting to skip, um, to observe these fish and try to understand what they determine is a good home. Time for a few quick questions. Hey, look. species and sex, like I said, like the males, um, they'll try and occupy a hole for longer. But yeah, I, I would have had more time to include videos. It would, you would see them like go around and kind of like try out different holes. And sometimes um, they would even like, you would see one in a hole and then we would come over and like try and start fighting it for that hole. So there is like a bit of like intraspecific competition for the holes themselves. So they don't stay in one hole their whole life. They kind of like switch around. Go ahead. Did you leave the blocks in there for the blends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frank said just to leave them. Um, it'd be too hard to get them out. And now someone else can check them out in there. <laughs> Somebody else has one last question? Yes. Here's one. Measure the depth of the natural. Um, <laughs> they weren't super stoked about this, but I would take um, the zip tie and like try and get it around them and like <laughs> place it in until I found, until I felt the end and then I'd take the zip tie out and measure it. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, did you get to see any bloodies um, on land? I heard there's some like mm -hmm. amphibious ones. Oh, I did not. <laughs> Brooke, fast question. How much do you charge your tenants per hole? <laughs> Santa Barbara. Um, she is Zara Katzenstein and we'll be talking about spotted eagle rays. Alright, hello and welcome. I'm very excited to share with you my presentation on the abundance and psychedelity of individually identified spotted eagle rays in northwestern Costa Rica. My name is Zara Katzenstein and I am from UC Santa Barbara. So first, I'd just like to give you an introduction to these amazing creatures. They live in tropical regions all around the world, but my project focused on the Pacific spotted eagle ray. They live in coral reefs, rocky outcroppings, and sandy areas, and they can live up to 60 meters deep, but they're usually seen in the middle of the water column when they're swimming or at the bottom feeding. They primarily eat crustaceans and bivalves, and they're understudied, meaning there's not much information on their large-scale movements or behavior. They have live births of four to six pups, but young rays are highly susceptible to predation because there is no parental care. So they're born and then they must quickly learn their electroreception, water sensing, and swimming skills before a shark swoops in and eats them. They also reach sexual maturity after four to six years, so naturally they have really slow reproduction. And their populations are declining. Their populations are declining because of a combination of their naturally slow reproduction, climate change, and fishing pressures. They suffer habitat and food loss as coral reefs die off because of wa rising water temperatures and acidification. And they are unintentionally caught in gill nets and shrimp trawls. 
Um, and the rays get caught in the long nets that hang down, and they eventually die because of this. So all of these factors have led to spotted eagle rays being listed as vulnerable on the endangered species list. So after I kind of started researching, I wanted to research what is the site fidelity and home range of the Pacific spotted eagle rays. And to do this, I would use image analysis and ray identification. So what is site fidelity? Site fidelity is the tendency of an organism to return to a site, and home range is the total area an organism frequents. And just something fun to point out on this slide, you can see this ray has this extremely long tail, which is really cool to see. But a lot of the other pictures of rays will have really short tails because their tails will break when they um, are attacked by predators or hit on a rock, um, and they can survive without a long tail. So for my methods, I would take my, a boat out to my site, I'd attach a GoPro to my arm, and I would enter the water and start surveying the area by swimming in a specific pattern. When I saw a ray, I would dive down and try to film it. I would usually dive between three meters and five meters to get a close picture to get an accurate image of the ray. Then I would return to where I left off in my survey and keep swimming to find more rays. After I got out of the water, I would record the site, time, what the tide was doing, and how many rays I saw at each site. When I got back, I took all the pictures of rays and I compared them to each other to see if I was seeing any of the same rays. Then I took my pictures and compared them to pictures from a previous study taken in the same area of spotted eagle rays to see if I had seen any from previous years. So how do you identify a ray? Well, just like a human fingerprint, every ray has a different set of spots. And if you identify certain features, you can then identify the ray. So for my project, I focused on areas A and D, which are the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin. So here's an example of how different two rays can be in the same species. These are both Pacific spotted eagle rays at the same site, but you can see one has circles, lines, and half circles, while the other has primarily solid, single spots. So when I would compare ray, I would start with the pelvic fin. So here's another example of me looking at the pelvic fin. You can see again, one has primarily single, solid dots, and the other has half circles and circles. Then I would look at for unique features. So a unique feature would be a gap in dots, a cluster of dots, uh, a large line, and also evidence of predation. For example, I saw one ray that did not have a right pelvic fin at all, and most likely been bitten off by a predator. And lastly, I would look at the entire pectoral fin to look for patterns. So my results. In total, I saw 29 rays. I was able to capture 25 videos, and of those 25 videos, I could find 23 individual rays. No rays were seen twice during the two weeks, and one ray was previously seen in 2017. I collected data at three sites over 13 days. Uh, first, my first site was Baja Rojo, which I visited 13 times. It's a rocky outcropping, and I saw 27 rays. The next two sites were Baja Hicote and Cosineris Island. Um, they're both coral and rocky, and I saw only one ray at each site, but I did visit them significantly less than Baja Rojo. Lastly, I compared my data to data from a study on spotted eagle ray pattern diversity published in 2021. The previous study identified 74 rays at 10 sites over five years, and in total they only resaw three rays. They eat, each resaw ray was only seen one month apart, two at the same site, and one 3.4 kilometers from the original site. After I compared my rays with those rays, I found that one of the rays I had seen had also been seen in that study, and I saw it 3.4 kilometers from the first site, um, and it was first seen in 2017, so five years ago, and this is the longest period of time between reef sightings in Costa Rica so far. Um, I named this ray that I resaw Quinn. So here you can see she was first seen on May 6, 2017 at Isla Minecos, and then I saw her again 3.4 kilometers at Baja Rojo on November 27th. I identified her using this three set of spots and also these set of double spots. And unfortunately, when I saw her, um, she had a fishing line wrapped around her tail, as you can see in this video. Oh 
And none of the rays in the 2021 study had fishing line on their rays, but of course increased pollution and specifically plastic pollution in the ocean leads to higher mortality of marine life, including rays. So what did I find? I found that I was able to individually identify rays, and over small time scales, spotted E rays do move frequently between sites. This was seen by me returning to the same site and continuously seeing new rays. They most likely move frequently to avoid predation, competition between rays, and because of food availability. They also possibly could be steered by human and boat presence. Their home range could be 36.3 square kilometers based on the resettings of 3.4 kilometers apart. Um, and they are strong, agile swimmers, so moving um, large distances is not hard for them. So their home range could be even bigger than that, but we need more information to be fully certain about that. And lastly, they do return to the same sites over long time scales, and that was shown by the resetting of Quinn. So, why is it important to identify spotted eagle rays? Well, like I said, they're listed as endangered on the ICUN endangered species list, but their close relative, the Atlantic spotted eagle ray, is listed as endangered. So they're on their way to becoming endangered. So without very much research on their behavior and large scale movements, it's hard to identify specific ways to help spotted eagle rays. So as we gain a better understanding of their movements, we can help implement changes if, need, if needed to help protect them. And currently, there are ongoing projects to do this. Um, scientists are combining their data to form a portfolio of ray pictures through different regions to track movements. The AETOSID project is currently going on in Costa Rica in collaborations with scientists in Mexico to track movements in the Pacific. And I will be adding my pictures to that project as well. And another important aspect is that in areas with high gill net use, education on fishing practices and incentives to switch gear to more sustainable ways of fishing could help lower spotted eagle rate mortality and help their populations. And a big thank you to all these amazing people who helped with my project. I couldn't have done it without them. And I will now open the floor to questions. I saw a lot of them alone, and then I also saw them in pairs. But I would, when I followed the pairs, they would like split off. So I'm not sure if they were intentionally swimming together or they were both just looking for food or something. Yeah, go ahead. What was your reaction when you realized that you didn't have a repeat? Well, at first I questioned it because I was like, "There's no way." So then I asked like a bunch of people to come and check, and then when I did, I got really, really excited. I have a question. At what point did you realize that you could use the patterns to identify individuals? In the study? Yes. Well, <laughs> you, you set out to study these rays. Yeah. Um, um, on the field trip, I saw four rays, but every time I saw them, I thought they were different species because they did look really different. And then when I researched it, I found out that they really were the same species. So then I started asking questions about like why would they look so different. And to this day, there isn't any like concrete research on why they have such different spot patterns. Like, what, what is the advantage of having different spots? Yes. Were you able to get a fishing line off Quinn's? No. Um, Quinn was really fast. frantic and not <laughs> swimming that great. And it was wrapped around like the area where there is the stinger. So okay. even if she let us get close, we probably wouldn't. Thank you.
Our next speaker from UC Santa Cruz is Isabel Blue, and she will be speaking about colors in pufferfish. <laughs> Pufferfish. Uh, the scientific name is Erothron meleagris and is commonly known as guinea fowl puffer. Um, so there's actually not a lot of research done on this species. Most of it is surrounding around their diet because they're coralivorous fish. Um, but they're from the family Tetraodontidae, which is known for having four teeth that are fused into a beak, which is similar to the parrotfish. And uh, they're really prominent in the aquarium trade and they can go up to even $500. Um, and this is largely due to the fact that they have different color morphologies. So two of the stable morphologies that they have is this darker blue to black with the white dots and then also this yellow morphology. And because there is variation uh, among the morphologies such as this one where it has like brown spots um, or these ones where one is actually black with white spots. Um, and then individuals such as this, which look like a, um, a mix of both morphologies, there has been a lot of talk that the pufferfish can actually change from one morphology type to the other within the span of its lifetime. And some theories on why there's different color morphologies include aposematic coloration. And so this is basically a warning strategy for prey to their predators to say, don't eat me, I can harm you. And a really, really cool um, example of this is actually the clownfish, because they themselves are not toxic, but they have a mutualistic relationship with sea anemones, which can sting their predators. Um, other examples are also monarch butterflies and the sea lemon, which is a new brief. Um, and relating this back to the guinea fowl puffer, they actually, like a lot of other pufferfish, are toxic. And so it's theorized that as they gain toxicity through their lifetime, they change from the blue with spotted morphology to the yellow morphology. Another possible rationale for the different morphology types is it's a reputation causing xanthism. And xanthism is simply just a yellow coloration uh, in the pigment. And this is common in the animal kingdom, especially in birds. Um, and although it's seen in many different species of fish, it's not common for individuals to have this morphology. Um, and so this kind of led me to believe that maybe it wasn't a reputation when I was doing my study. Um, another possible rationale is that it's recessive tree. And so uh, this is the smooth trunk fish, and there's a paper on this that discusses the possibility that their yellow morpho morphology is a recessive tree. And so I wanted to look into that and see if this is also a possible rationale. And it turns out that my data did support this based on Mendel's principles of inheritance, which was stating that uh, when comparing the proportion of dominant to recessive traits, it came at a three to one ratio. The final uh, possible reason we're gonna talk about is mating behavior. And so mating behavior is incredibly influential on the phenotype of animals, and it can actually result in sexual dimorphism, which is when the males and the females look different from each other. And this can be due specifically to female selection. So, uh, as an example, you have peacocks here, and the female is the one that has the like browner feathers, and then the male is the one with the feathers extended. And so the females are actually preferential, preferentially <laughs> mate with males that are more colorful. Um, other possible options could be that seasonal coloration due to mating, so if they just turn yellow when they're mating, or also sort of breeding, so maybe this is um, a case of the beginning of speciation. So the yellow ones preferentially mate with yellow ones and the spotted ones with the spotted ones. So for my methods, I got to go snorkeling and free diving off the coast of Coquina Keel, and I would take videos of all the individuals and try to get um, pictures of both sides. Um, and when identifying individuals, I wanted to get both sides of them so that I could accurately say that each of the individuals that I was counting for my data was separate individuals and I wasn't counting them twice. So similar to Zara's study where she was trying to identify each individual. Um, sometimes this posed challenges though because they would be uncooperative occasionally and so <laughs> <laughs> it 
if I approach them too quickly, they would flee or hide, or they would also do this behavior where if I was approaching them from their right side, they wouldn't let me go around them because they wanted to keep me in the field of vision. So for my results, I found that there is statistically more of the blue morphology than the yellow morphology, and this was out of 37 individuals, individuals 35 of them were blue and uh, five of them were yellow. Uh, and for the last part of my talk, I want to go into some observed behaviors that weren't directly um, geared towards my study, but were really interesting and I think are probably the most fun part <laughs> of my study. So uh, the first thing is what I talked about a little bit before and how they would try to keep me in their field of vision and they wouldn't let me go around them and that was really interesting. Um, also they had other defensive behaviors, so they have fleeing, they have hiding, and then as a last result, resort, they'll inflate. And so I actually only observed this of the 37 individuals once, and it happened to be a yellow individual, which is really interesting. And I actually observed a lot of this skittish behavior and very defensive behavior from the yellow individuals um, specifically. And so that could also tie into possible rationale for the differences in the morphology types. Um, and then the last really cool behavior that I saw was physiological color change. And so, as of the data that I have found so far um, of pre-published literature and research, there has not been any um, yeah, there's no, not been any research on this species performing physiological color change. So this is really exciting. And uh, physiological color change is different from morphological because physiological is rapid, so it can happen within a minute. And so if you look at the two individuals here, they're actually the same individual. And so this top one was taken probably within 30 seconds of the bottom one, and it gains this banding on its brow and also on its snout. Um, and it disrupts the like outline of the fish, which I think is a form of disruptive coloration, which is a tactic that some animals use so that it's harder for predators to tell the outline of them. Um, and then this is a really good example of the behavior they do when they um, exhibit this banding. They'll curl in their caudal fin after they hide, and then they'll stop moving their pectoral, pectoral fins. They'll actually be completely static. And then they gain this banding on their brow and their nose, and then occasionally they get it even on their back, which is kind of a little bit obvious in this one. It's kind of hard to tell. But uh, this one is really cool because this is actually the same individual, all of it. And so within the span of two minutes, they, um, it came into hiding and then sat and got the banding and then it moved to another spot and then got the banding again. This is another example. This one is kind of special to me because this is the individual where I actually noticed that they were doing this color change. Originally, I thought it could just be the way the light was shining on them, and then actually seeing this individual, um, I have, the, have a video of it changing. That was really, really cool. Uh, final comments. So as a little bit of a summary, um, I found in my study that there is significantly more blue morphology individuals than yellow morphology, and I saw some really interesting physiological color change in this species. Um, future studies that I think would be very important for learning more about the species would be about their toxin levels, about their genetics, if possibly the colors associated with their gender, and um, just general behavioral studies because so little is known about the species. Um, finally, I just want to thank the Quikini Weedies, <laughs> uh, which includes my fellow students, Frank Joyce and the Lara Boys and Leo. Um, and also I want to thank Naomi because really the support that she provides for us is something that <laughs> is incredibly amazing. <laughs>
if there was correlation. Um, but I did find, like, I think the most amount of yellow ones that I found in a site was also the site that I found the most amount of blue ones. Yeah, bro. Like with the spotted eagle rays, do you know if you can identify the spotted morphology fish based off of like, their spot patterns? Yeah, yeah, so that's actually really cool. So if you look at these ones, these are really good examples. So some of them have very distinct patterns. So like they'll have kind of like the semicircles, like the eagle rays, or they'll have combined spots. And then some, this one's a shitty, sorry, a bad picture. <laughs> but like, some of them have more uniform dots, which makes it more challenging. Um, and then some will have like yellow on their tips or like other really defining features. Let's start there. Um, do you think you're going to publish your results? Um, I want to. I reached out to um, a professor and some graduate students that also work on pufferfish. Um, so I'm in the process of seeing if it's a possibility. More questions? Yes, Pat. So was the banding, has that been documented before, or is this like the first time that you know of that it's been documented? For this species, I believe it's the first time, but it has been documented in other species. Sam? Uh, do you think the results in any way correlate with maybe pressure on um, the pectrade with the yellow individuals? Are those more sought after? Um, I do think that would be really interesting to look into. When I talked to my Nito, he said that he thinks that the people that collect the fish for aquarium trade take them in equal amounts, which would make me think that at this location maybe it's not. But also, this is just word of mouth, so I don't have any like data to support that or deny it. But they do go, sorry, the yellow ones are more expensive sometimes online, so it would support that they're more sought after, so potentially. Thank you, Izzy. comes from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Haley Fox. Uh, she'll be talking about um, fish diversity in different sites. Transportations of goods and people. 
because of the world, much of the world's population lives in coastal areas. Um, sometimes logs, re laws, regulation, and resource management are important because it affects what is taken out and put into the ocean. And some other ways that we impact the ocean is through overfishing. Um, sometimes commercial and factory fishing can cause loss of species and noise pollution um, from naval vessels or large shipping vessels can impact the behavior of marine species. Also, um, agriculturally, the increased use of fertilizers has, and warming of the ocean has contributed to eutrophication in certain areas of the world and this can negatively affect biological processes as well as our carbon emissions has caused ocean warming and ocean acidification. So this led me to my research question, which is what is the relationship between government protection and fish richness and abundance? Um, so just to note that government protection is variable depending on where it is implemented and how it is implemented. Um, so the results are very highly reliant on the performance and enforcement of it. So some positives that can come with government protection is it can maintain ecological bi biodiversity, it can preserve habitats, it can maintain safe water quality, and provide economic success, success as well as food security if the loss of species is affecting that area's ability um, to get food and grow food. Um, so negatives that can come along with it are relocation of populations, um, economic harm if it is disruptive to certain industries in the area, and it can result in increased fishing in the unprotected areas, which can result in loss of species. And again, the results are variable. So my project um, included me swimming transects in different locations. So each transect was 30 meters long, and I would identify fish two meters on both sides of the transect. Any fish that I couldn't identify while swimming, I would take videos and photos of with the GoPro and identify later. Um, and I counted individual fish and then also took note of different species and how abundant they were. And then data was collected at six non-protected sites and two government protected sites. And this is a list of the locations surveyed and the distances from the Kuhinikeo Moye, um, starting with the closest to the farthest, with the two government protected sites being the farthest from the Moye. Originally, before I started this project, I kind of believed that the farther I got from the Moye, the higher the abundance of fish and species would be, um, because I thought it might take more energy or more resources with the boats and things to get farther away. But, um, my results didn't necessarily follow that trend. Um, so for this graph, the pink coral represents the substrate that the transect was done, and the rocks also represent the substrates, as well as the black and white little trees or dead coral. Um, so the sites with the most coral coverage for my transects personally were Isla Cocinera, which was government protected, and then Baja Rojo, which was not. And the order of the X axis is from closest to the Moye to farthest. And then as you can see, the site with the most dead coral and coral rubble is Machu Polito, which had a pretty low number of species um, in comparison. And then these are just some photos of some of the fun creatures we got to see while swimming. And then for this result, this is the, on the y-axis, is the number of individual fish counted per transect. Um, so as you can see, that trend didn't necessarily follow as you got farther away from the Moye, but the farthest site did have the highest number of total fish counted, as well as Baja Rojo and Playa Hikote being similarly in second place. And then this on the y-axis is the total number of species. And as you can tell, the government protected site, Isla Cocinera, had the highest number of species, mm -hmm. as well as Baja Rojo in second. Yeah, so um, from my results, I was able to conclude that coral coverage had a lot to do with the higher abundance of species and the higher amount of individual fish. And I was able to see that Machu Polito, the site with the most dead coral and coral rubble, had the lowest number of individual fish observed. Um, and then 
again, yeah, the, the, the trend farther from the Kohene Kiyomoye was not necessarily increasing for my specific transects. And then some possible future studies that I think would be worth conducting would be definitely at Machu Picchu. I think it would be awesome if government funding could be allocated towards more studies to figure out why the reef there is dying and for restoration efforts. And then also at Bahia Tomas, I think it would be worth investigating if it would benefit from government protection because it did have the lowest species diversity out of all the unprotected sites and in the past has suffered from coral sedimentation and also did have a low abundance of fish. And I just wanted to thank everyone that made my study possible and all the help we got in Bohini Kiel as well as all my peers. <laughs>
And the second one is clicks for echolocation. <laughs> so um, vessel noise can negatively impact these vocal cetaceans. Um, vessel impacts on coastal environments have increased in recent years and are predicted to rise further. Um, so coastal fauna are especially vulnerable to these um, to vessel noise. One pervasive way that vessel noise impacts vocal cetaceans is through auditory masking. Um, and so basically that just means that um, the vessel noise overlaps and covers up the vocalization so they're not able to communicate. Um, and some cetaceans have been shown to change their physical behavior, so like diving for longer or leaving the area altogether, um, as well as their acoustic behavior, so maybe um, vocalizing louder or um, changing the frequencies which they're um, vocalizing at. And so I guess I just want to give an example. So it's kind of like when you're talking and then all of a sudden a loud motorcycle goes by and so you try and talk louder or just stop talking altogether. Um, or if it's too loud, you just cover your ears. However, marine mammals can't do that. So they <laughs> run the risk of hearing damage, either temporary or permanent. Okay, oh, this is a cool video. I did not take the video. Um, so this just shows the um, subspecies I was looking at. And so um, the pan tropical spotted dolphin has a very coastal habitat. Um, it ranges from like 200 kilometers um, from Mexico to Ecuador. Um, and so because of their very coastal habitat, they um, are often overlap with vessel noise. And they're also very social marine mammals, as you can tell. And so they um, communicate, they use um, unique vocalizations to communicate among one another and identify each other. So for my project, I looked at um, three, the vocalizations of three different populations. Also, I realized this should say Gulf of Santa Elena, so I apologize for that. Um, so the first site in Panama, the Gulf of Cherokee, um, has the lowest exposure to vessel noise. The second, Isla, Isla del Caño, has the uh, highest exposure to vessel noise. And then Gulf of Santa Elena has um, moderate um, exposure to vessel noise. And so my question is, how does the acoustic behavior of the coastal pan-tropical spotted dolphin subspecies differ with varying exposures to vessel traffic? So to answer this, I chased dolphins two, for two <laughs> weeks, and it was awesome. Um, and so we used boat surveys to identify dolphin pods. Once, once the pods were identified, I lowered the hydrophone into the water about 1.5 uh, meters, and the sampling rate was at 96 kilohertz, which just means that's the sampling frequency that was taken per second. And it was at a 65 um, decibel gain level, so just how um, the loudness of the input signal. And the recordings varied from one minute to 30 minutes, depending on the dolphin's behavior. So if the dolphins were swimming away, there were a lot shorter recordings. <laughs> um, and so Raven Pro was used uh, to annotate song units and for acoustical analysis. And so this just shows what I did in Raven. I just um, annotated each song unit, so it drew boxes around them, um, or the whistles. And then, um, and then the um, recording frequencies and stuff are um, down in the table below. And so the three parameters I looked at for each whistle is the delta frequency, which is the bandwidth of the frequency, which is just like how, or the bandwidth of the vocalization, which is just how many frequencies um, that particular call is taking up. The delta time, which is the duration of the call. And then the peak frequency, which is the maximum power uh, the frequency of maximum power within the call. So among the nine comparisons, um, there were eight that were significantly different. So the, this is a graph showing duration of the individual populations. And so the Cherokee population had the longest vocalizations with an average duration of 10.64 seconds. Um, the other two had significantly lower durations of vocalizations. Um, and then this one's look, this is looking at the bandwidth, um, and so the Panama population in Cherokee had a significantly narrower bandwidth as well as a lower average um, delta frequency bandwidth compared to the other two sites. And um, this graph is looking at peak frequency, and it shows that Isla del Caño had the lowest peak frequency compared to the other two sites. Um, and Panama had a lot more variation within the peak frequencies. So why do dolphins in Panama appear to vocalize for longer? One reason for this is that um, the dolphins in Panama are exposed to less um, vessel noise, and so they're able to vocalize for longer without interruption. 
Um, alternatively, rather than the ones in Panama actually vocalizing for longer, it's possible the other two populations are just producing shorter calls because they are actually being interrupted by um, boat noise and masked. So why do the dolphins in Panama vocalize in a narrower frequency band? One reason for this is that it's optimal for communication within that particular group. Um, and it's also possible that the other two pods are compensating for masking um, by utilizing larger frequency bands because that way they can um, hopefully get um, their calls like farther out because lower frequencies actually propagate better underwater. So if they're using a wider range of frequencies, it's possible that um, they're able to propagate farther. Um, and so a study by Endler um, suggests that dolphins use either both or one of these two methods in order to compensate for masking. So they might choose frequency bands, which minimize background noise, and they might also use species-specific frequency bands. And so the dolphins in this study may be compensating for loss of communication space using these um, methods. Okay, so why does the Kanyo Island population have the lowest peak frequencies? Um, one explanation is that they're emphasizing more power at lower frequencies because lower frequencies propagate farther underwater. And so if they're being covered up by boat noise, um, they might be able to propagate their songs farther. Um, and a study looking at bottlenose dolphins found that they reduced their peak frequencies when in the presence of boat noise. And so similarly, the dolphins in the study could be doing something similar. Okay. Main takeaways, um, Panama population had the longest vocalizations and the lowest bandwidth. Isla del Caño had the lowest peak frequencies. Um, and one main explanation is that increases in vessel noise contributed to these vocal adaptions so that they can avoid masking. However, another explanation could just be that these are natural variations and, and it's just simply different dialects between these three different populations. So I think further studies should look at a wider range of populations um, over a longer period of time to see how their vocalizations differ. Um, okay, and with that I would just like to say thank you to everyone who helped with the project. Also, I don't know why, but I forgot to put um, Laura May Colado on here, and she has helped me so much during this project. She um, lent me her hydrophone and she also gave me a ton of guidance, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. Lots of time for questions. I would guess they're probably just communicating, but actually the pantropical spotted dolphin has also been shown to um, like communicate with other species, like bottlenose dolphins, and like so it's possible that they're also communicating to other species as well. Yes. Follow up to that. Are they mostly communicating like danger signals, or is it like for food or other forms of communication? I think it just. It could be a lot of different things. Okay. I mean, I know that they're really social, so they might just be trying to identify each other. They're just talking. Yeah, there's talking, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, where did the data from Panama and the uh, other places come Good from? question. I did not go to Panama. Um, <laughs> Laura May Guado um, had already um, recorded vocalizations from the dolphin populations there, and so I just compared with the population that I actually recorded to those two. Yes. Uh, my question is kind of related to Sophie's, but I remember like when we were doing the data collection, um, our, like sometimes they were feeding, sometimes they were like running away. Yeah. Like, did you notice a difference between the vocalizations like in times when they were feeding and like in other times? Yeah, it's a good question. They were doing? The only difference was that um, like the recordings were shorter because because mm -hmm. okay. they're swimming away versus when they were like that one time they were surrounding the boat. Yeah. So I didn't so really harder to tell. Yeah, 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 I didn't really notice any significant Yes. <clears throat> that, uh, you should remember to do log a line with your acknowledgement. Yeah, I know. And also <laughs> you should be clear about the data you are using for the amount is that kind of coming from here, so I don't understand you didn't have to repair there. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Um, 
the first three days we didn't see any, so I was really frustrated. But then I think, like after that, we started seeing them every day, and they were kind of in the same um, area after a while. So we just kind of started going around that area every day, and they, for the most part, were always there. Yes. Do you have suggestions for like, future studies on how to determine if it, it is impacting to the most pollution? Purpose? There's a significant lack of studies like on this particular um, subspecies because they have a really small range. So um, I don't think there's a lot I could compare it to right now, but that would be really interesting in the future. I think. Thank you, start to <laughs> So we're going to take a, a break of 10 plus minutes. Um, for those of you who are new to the place, there's bathrooms um, as you go out the door to the right and then to the left. Um, and there is refreshments, tea, coffee, and some things to eat. Thank you all. Um, we'll announce when we're getting started again.
plastic in fish and novel fish food. Uh, now is the turn for Lee and he's going to talk to us about insect families on Quahinikil Island and the Northwest Costa Rica mainland. Okay, before I start, I'm going to say hi mom and to all her students. Um, you better be nice to Miss Chrissy today. <laughs> okay, so I'm giving a presentation as Leo so kindly introduced on insect families present in Quahinikil Island and the Northwest Costa Rican mainland. And so to start, I'm gonna give some introduction on some insects. So as many might know already, insects make up a very big amount of diversity on Earth because they're so small and you can't see them half the time, you might not even know they're there. But they are very important that they provide many ecosystem services, including pollination, decomposition, nutrient recycling, and our food for higher trophic levels. So without them, the bigger animals that we do see might not be around. Surprisingly, at least surprising to me, um, only, I mean, only 20% of insects have actually been discovered and studied as of 2016. That was where I got that statistic from, and so there's still so many insects that can still be studied, and um, Costa Rica is known as one of the most diverse places in the world, including with insects. And now I want to do a little bit of introduction on islands, because that's also part of my study. Um, and first and foremost, I'm going to bring up the island geography theory, which is the idea that bigger and closer islands to the mainland are more likely to have more successful species in general, whether it be plants, insects like I'm studying, or any other animals. Um, and so my study focuses on the northwest coast of Costa Rica, which is right here. And you might have seen a couple other maps just like it from previous um, presenters. And I wanted to point out that in 2011, Jennifer M. Jacobs and various other awesome uh, researchers did a study of ants at the Isla Morcielagos, which is not in this map specifically because I didn't study those, but um, the reason that I point that out is because the smaller islands that I did study, like in this picture, have not been studied yet. On insects, at least. So. <laughs> um, okay, so that led me to my question, um, because I'm interested in insects and islands was how does the composition of insect families on Kohinikil Islands vary and differentiate from the mainland? And what factors might cause these differences? And sprinkled throughout my presentation are a bunch of pictures that I took. So don't worry, it's not that they're not credited. I took them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. So next I'm gonna go into my methods on the mainland. So there's a few slides I have depending on where the location is. So for mainland sites, um, it was a little bit 
easier, one can say, because of accessibility. And so I picked two sites, which ended up being um, one which was about 200 meters from a mangrove in a flowering area, and then one was about 200 meters from a beach in a flowering area. And the reason I picked flowering areas is because insects generally like flowers more, and I wanted to see as many as I could in a specific time limit. And so after a lot of figuring out which like insects like what traps mo most, I decided on doing tuna and honey traps and rotten tomato traps and doing 10 of each kind. And so it would be where I would have 20 traps all together, but 10 pairs. So if I put a tuna, tuna and honey trap here, about three meters apart from it, I would put a rotten tomato trap. And beetles and ants really liked those. Um, and in between setting those traps up, so I would set up 10 pairs, as I said, and I would check them every 30 minutes. In between those 30 minutes, I would use opportunistic sightings as well, because, for example, Lepidoptera or um, butterflies and moths don't really like tuna and honey very much, so the only way that I would record them is if I looked for them. Um, and then in between all that time, I would take a lot of pictures, um, a lot of pictures, to identify later, because they're so small and sometimes pictures weren't great. But I did get a lot better by then, so. Um, and so those are the methods on the mainland. And then on the island, it was a little, or on the islands, it was a little bit more difficult because um, of location, clearly. So these are the three islands that I did. This one, oh, sorry, let's start with this one. This one is Isla David, which is right here. This one is Isla Muñecos, which is right there. And then the really small one is Isla de los Loros. And um, so the reason the methods were different is because um, there were some obstacles. So these are some pictures of each island, and as you can see, a lot of them were really rocky, or we had to do kind of a lot of rock climbing, which was really fun, but made it difficult for me to space them out the same amount as on the mainland. So not necessarily them all being three meters apart. I still did do the 20 traps or 10 pairs, but um, it kind of varied on how big the range was. And after I did all my fun adventuring on islands in the mainland, um, these were my methods after I did my field work. So with all those pictures that I would take, um, I would identify them thanks to iNaturalist or insect identification books. And based on, I would first start with order and then I would go to family and then I would go to genus. And depending on where they were at, so these were all four of my sites, mainland and then my three islands, I would mark where I saw them and if there was a similarity. And this example is um, ants, because there were a lot of ants at every single one I say. And so let's get into some results. Um, so first I just want to say um, the y-axis right here is the number of insects. And then as you can see here, these are my four sites. And on this side, there's a different color for each type of um, order. So I did it based on order because if I would have done it family, it would have been a little bit, it would have been very much complicated. Um, what I discovered, and I also kind of expected, is I saw the most insects on the mainland, um, but I found it interesting that on every site there was a wide variety of Lepidoptera and Hymenoptera, which Lepidoptera is like butterflies and moss, Hymenoptera is wasps, bees, and ants. Um, and then there were some other interesting trends that I just wanted to point out is how on Odonato was only seen on Isla David, um, Latideo was only seen on Isla Muñecos, and Neuroptera, which even to the same genus, which is interesting, so they're very similar, were seen on Isla David and Isla de los Loros. Um, so that is kind of like a grand scheme of every, everything that I saw. Um, and then I also wanted to point out, because as I kind of gave the intro on islands. How is this relevant to islands? Um, based on what I saw, the size and distance from the mainland is most likely not the only factor that should be considered in terms of insects on the islands. Um, and the reason that I say that is because it, it doesn't line up with that trend perfectly. So even though the mainland did have the most insects at 52, which was cool, Isla Muñecos, which was the largest, but the farthest away from Midland had the second most. So then I thought, okay, maybe just size makes a big difference. But 
Then Isla de los Loros, which was significantly smaller than the other two islands, had more than Isla de Vite. So I'm like, okay, maybe size and distance both they play a part, but they're not the biggest part in insects being seen on islands in general. And so what I concluded is no matter the size and distance from the mainland, there is a variety of insects on Guajinaquil Islands. And I do need to point out some of the obstacles because this was only a two week study and studying such a diverse group is very difficult, especially because I didn't focus on one specific Order, for example, if I only would have done ants, then that might have been different, um, a different study altogether. So in the future, um, I think that further students, which I would hope future, future, future students would do this because it was very fun being on the islands, made me feel like a kid. Um, I hope that they would take into account the different terrains and how that would make a difference in what you see. For example, Isla de Vide was a lot, the soil was a lot drier, um, and so that made a difference in what we saw. Another thing to take into account is a lot of other critters that were there. Um, so apparently hermit crabs and tinosaurs also love tuna and honey and tomatoes. <laughs> so sometimes I didn't even get to take pictures of traps because they were gone before the next time I got to see them uh, because they were eaten, which was fine. But also weather makes a big difference. On some days it was sprinkling or it had just got done raining. So the composition of insects was different. And then also there was, I would like to call a time limit of, I could only be on each island for a specific amount of time. And I think that if I was there for a longer time, for more than two weeks, I would have seen more, be able to make more conclusive results. But I'm proud of the things that I did see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I want to acknowledge on my Kahini Keel peers and Monteverde, I know they're not up there, but y'all also were supporting me. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the back, my advisors, my many island and ocean helpers, and my homestead family. Cool, now we have questions. Let me show Sophie and then Brooke. Okay. Oh, sorry, is that your job? <laughs> okay, no, sorry, Leo. Go ahead. Awesome presentation. Um, I know you mentioned you had a time limit on each island, but did you observe each island for the same amount of time? Yes, sorry, I should have mentioned that. On each, including the mainland, so I had to cut myself off because I could have been looking for hours if I wanted to. At each site, I spent 3.5 to 4 hours. And the only reason there was a range of that 30 minutes was based on a lot of collaboration with the other students of like when they were going to pick me up yeah. from the island. <laughs> Uh, Brooke, right? Yeah. So I noticed, or you mentioned weather like being different on certain days, like sprinkling and stuff, and also island size. So did you talk about like if it felt windier, or like if it felt different being on a certain island? That's like why the different insects might be there. Yes, I actually every day after I got done with whatever site I was on, I took a lot of notes on what the weather was like, including wind. Um, the only difference is. We only got nine minutes to present. So um, there wasn't like a huge difference that I saw, but wind is a factor that I do think makes a difference on what is seen there. Like I wouldn't see flies on days that were super windy. And did all the islands kind of look the same? Or like did some of very different like side views? I know this is not the best picture, but that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so Isla David was really um, steep and dusty for lack of a better word. And so that varied differently from Muñecos, where it was way more canopy coverage, and you could actually stand, once you got to the top, you could stand and it'd be a lot wider, so it'd be more humid. It almost felt like you could be in a mainland if you were in the middle and you were looking around. And Isla de los Loros, we couldn't even really get to the top, unless you're Leo and you're just like a really good rock climber, which he <laughs> did. Um, and it, so that was mostly rocky. So they were all very different in looks, I guess, yeah. Yeah, um, Rachel. Do you have any like of your own hypotheses as to why Hymenoptera and Lepidoptera were the two most frequently seen families or orders on the Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, for Lepidoptera, which was actually funny, and a lot of other Kohini Keel people that were there might have noticed when we're on the boat in the middle or like in between gulfs, we would even see butterflies like chasing the boat. Um, I would like to think they are just more mobile, so it's a lot easier for them to get there. Um, and then in terms of Hymenoptera, 
it wasn't, even though I did see bees and wasps, it was more the ants that were more present. And for lack of a better way to put it, ants are just everywhere, they just get everywhere. So I feel like, and also um, the queens fly. So it's likely they flew there and then set up camp. <laughs> yeah. How do you think you should wear your pet your traps specifically on the items but also like on the main ones since it's, there's so many different places you can choose? Yeah, that was a difficult endeavor. What I, so for the mainland, I ended up choosing flowering areas because I wanted to set a time limit and, but I also wanted to try to see as many insects as possible and just from past bug adventures, because I like bugs, um, flowering areas generally had the most. So that's why I chose the mainland sites. And so I actually went on to these islands thinking, oh, I'm gonna do the same thing. But there were some flowers sporadically, but there weren't like flowering areas. So, and this is, I'm glad you brought it up because it's definitely something I want to talk about, how it's, it was, um, I wouldn't say it was random. It was based on accessibility of like where I could get to is where I would set it up. So, possibly, like with more time, more resources, and more planning of where I would go to make them similar areas on each island, I would do that a little differently. But it really was like, for example, this one, we would climb up a slope and the first time we went, we couldn't really get into any of the brush. So it was only along the slope that I set up the traps, which would vary, I mean, which would make the amount of insects I see different. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Why not? Thank you, Lee, from UC San Diego. Now it's time for Hazel Kale. She is going to talk to us about fragmentation and regeneration of stony corals in Bahia Quahim Q. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Fragmentation and Regeneration of Stony Corals in Quahimu Q. Um, hi, Mom, if you're there. Oh. <laughs> okay, so, what is a stony coral? It's in the order Sleracotinia, and they're also car called hard corals. Um, they're also called reef building corals, and this is significant of their purpose. They build reefs. Um, and that is really important because reefs are home to 25% of all marine organisms. Just think about how big the ocean is for a second. That's 25%. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So they're kind of like my brother in a weird way. Um, they're really important, really successful, marvelous things. But you look at them and you're like, what are you doing on day to day? Like, you look kind of lazy. <laughs> yeah. So the individuals are all stomach and a little bit of mouth. So they spend most of the time digesting food that they didn't even create. Um, because they're symbionts to these little phytoplankton who live in their skin and photosynthesize and create 95% of their food for them. A oh, pretty good gig. And, yeah, and they sleep all day. <laughs> At night they wake up. Um, you got to hear a little bit about them from Isabel. They're also the, um, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Biofluorescent, yeah. Okay, and then in each coral head, there's a hundreds to thousands of these individual polyps. And um, in the coral heads, there's many, many coral heads that make up a reef. And that's their scientific classica classification, if you're interested. Um, a little background on my study. Uh, so this is where we were studying up here near Kohini Kiel. <laughs> and so in this area, there is upwelling in the dry season. So that means because the wind is coming there, that means it's blowing the surface water out and then um, deep water comes up, which is colder and has more nutrients. 
And this is usually good for the corals in Coahuila Kill because it means they're less susceptible to warming ocean temperatures and it also provides nutrients for the uh, zooanthellae. But um, there was an event in 2009 where there was extreme upwelling and it killed off a whole lot of the coral coverage. And it also happened to be uh, the same year that UCAP started documenting, taking data on coral coverage. So this is what it looked like in 2009. Not a lot of coral coverage. But luckily, over the years, it's been steadily increasing. So I was interested in why is it increasing? Why is regeneration happening? So this led me to my question, how is fragmentation related to reef health in Quahinica? Okay, first we've got to look at coral reproduction. Um, this happens in one of, one of two ways. First, I'll talk about sexual reproduction. This happens when there's a mass synchronized event where corals let out all the eggs and sperm. They go colonize new areas. We saw some of this actually in Bajo Rojo. There was individual coral heads where we were like, why, why is this like way up on a rock and not hear any other corals? Um, and that's because uh, it was sexually reproduced. And then the other way, which I'm going to talk about, is asexual reproduction, which happens when polyps bud, they split off, go into new ones, and then fragments fall off of the coral head, and those fragments will reestablish and go into corals. Okay, this was my methods and materials. Uh, same study sites as a lot of other um, studies. And then we went along, usually with Haley or Leo, and then we went and did like a 30 meter transect. And transect just means a way to divide the area so you can study it better. Um, and then we set down this quadrat, which was just PVC with strings attached in the middle area, and then I counted each square that had living coral growing underneath it, and then also fragments. I counted the dead fragments and the live fragments. The dead fragments were ones that had less than 50% live polyps on them, and the live ones were ones that had more than 50% live polyps. And the dead ones usually were bleached or had algae covering them. So this is what I found over, um, compared with data from the previous years. Um, we got the most coral coverage at El Hachal, which was kind of a big increase from the last year. And then we also had smaller increases at all the other sites. And I studied at Coquito as well, which had not been in yet. And then there's Bahia Tomas East, which I'm thinking before 29. 2009 had some coral, but wasn't anymore, and that was due to sedimentation, I think. Um, so this is what I found out with the fragments. El Hachal had the most fragments, healthy fragments. The yellow is healthy fragments, the brown is dead fragments, and this brown line is coral coverage. So there was a relationship between the amount of healthy fragments and the amount of coral coverage. We, I read some stats. <laughs> um, we did average coral coverage versus healthy fragments in select quadrats with 100% coral coverage. So this was just to isolate the fragmentation rather than getting it mixed up with the coral coverage. So I did that and I made a little thing and then I did all those tests and got some pretty good numbers for this study. <laughs> So, discussion. There are more, overall, more healthy fragments than dead fragments, and a stronger relationship between coral coverage and healthy fragmentation um, than coral coverage and dead fragmentation. So, there's a couple reasons this could be. One reason is that um, just because there's, that's like a strategy that is working for these corals is the asexual reproduction. So. That is one reason, and another reason, especially at Al Chal, that reason could be because of the substrate. It was a sandy area, and the corals there had this unique thing where there was little fragment balls on top of the coral. Like, there would be little tiny ones that you could pick up and take off, and these were 
um, I counted those as fragments, because they were, but they were like little brown things. And I was reading that that was an adaptation for corals on sand substrates to like grow the fragments within like, a place where they're secure, and then they fall off afterwards. And that could be one reason why a lot of had more. Conclusion, healthy amounts of fragmentation are contributing to increasing coral coverage in Copenhagen. These, she grows the little fragments herself and puts them on reefs, which is super cool and helpful to the world. Thanks yeah. to especially Witonski, Vol 2021. <laughs> I got all of my methods from Witonski Vol. <laughs> Microplastic almonds on fishes. Hi, um, once again, I'm Lindsay, and today I'll be talking about the presence of microplastics in the marine environment. Um, first, I want to talk about what are microplastics and why do we care about them. So, microplastics are defined as broken down pieces of bigger plastics that are less than five millimeters. So that's around the size of an eraser on a number two pencil. Um, they can be different sizes, shapes, colors, and they can vary in the chemical composition. 
Um, microplastics, they come from incorrect disposal, runoff, illegal dumping. They can come off our clothes when we wash them, just many different ways. Um, currently, there is 50 to 75 trillion pieces of plastics in the ocean, with around like 8 to 10 million metric tons being dumped or like being inputted per year. So kind of you, like an idea of what that is, that is 2.2 billion pounds, for those of you who don't know the metric. <laughs> um, we hear about them for many reasons. Uh, one of them would be like contact, so suffocation, entanglement, lacerations, and we saw that with um, Zara's um, Eagle Ray. We saw that on the tail they had um, plastic. And then another thing would be like toxic effects. So microplastics themselves, their chemical composition when entered into a organism, they can um, in fact or impact the organ function and also they can enter the bloodstream. And also because they're foreign bodies, they can cause a negative immune response. And lastly, and also what I think is the most important are PLPs or persistent organic pollutants. So they're able to attach to microplastics in the ocean, and then once um, an organism ingests them, they can bioaccumulate throughout the organism's lifetime and also throughout the trophic um, chain. So when POPs enter, they, just like the toxic effect of microplastics themselves, they can cause organ failure, they can even um, cause death, depending on the level of accumulation. So this leads to um, my question of how do microplastic levels vary in fish from different trophic levels? Because of the bioaccumulation of POPs, I wanted to see if a higher trophic level might have more microplastics. So for my methods, um, I collected 27 different fish, so around um, there's seven species. Um, first, I collected the entrails, which are just the internal organs of the fish. Um, I cut them up and then I strained them with water. Um, I added salt so it would become a saline solution so the microplastics would float to the top for easier extraction. And then I viewed that underneath the microscope just to count the number of microplastics per fish. And I did this, I did five samples per fish, so I had a total of 135 samples. Um, I just want to point out for these photos, um, one of the entrails that I uh, was given had like a parasite that like goes on the fish tongue or takes away the tongue and eats for the fish. I did not include that in my study because that would affect the results. Um, and I also wanted to show these two um, different slides of my samples just because the transparency of my samples did differ. So sometimes it could be a lot easier to see <coughs> microplastics in one versus the other. Um, I then uh, categorized the fish into the different trophic levels. I got the values from FishBase because they have their own trophic level database. And so I had three different fish species in trophic level three. So I have the Pacific mackerel, the short fin grunt, and the Latin grunt. And for trophic level four, I had the Pacific red snapper, spotted rose snapper, the fortune jack, and the albacore tuna. So the highest would be the albacore tuna and the fortune jack, with the lowest being the Pacific mackerel. So here are some more slides of like microplastics I did find. Um, so for these first two on the left, the top would be from the dissecting um, microscope. So I was unsure um, if that was a microplastic just because it did have a lot of algae and um, other materials surrounding it. But when I transferred it to a compound microscope, I can see that it is a microplastic because of the lack of cellular structure. And then so I have another one under a, a compound microscope just so you can see. And then lastly in the lower right corner, here's another example of how like algae and other like biomaterials can accumulate onto microplastics. Um, so for my results, 131 of my samples contained microplastics, so that was 97%. Um, I do. I wasn't really surprised by that result, but it is pretty significant to have that many. And then, in terms of my question, um, so I did separate between trophic levels. Um, trophic level four, two of the species did have a higher amount, but I just want to take note that those individual species, I did only have one fish, so that is five samples for each one. Um, 
while the other ones I had like a range from like five to ten. Um, based off of that, um, I like did a statistical test to compare the two different um, trophic levels, and I did not find significant difference with a p-value of 0.63. Um, even though I didn't find a significant um, value, I would say it's still important just because of the unseen effects of POPs and like the toxic effects of microplastics in general. Um, since POPs are still able to accumulate throughout the lifetime and through trophic levels, um, it's definitely like, still concerning that we found microplastics in 97%. Um, I just also want to add that microplastics are able to leave the digestive system. So kind of depending on when I got the fish, that could affect the microplastic levels. Um, but in future studies, I think looking at microplastic interactions throughout time, or through like a fish or a different organism's lifetime, can kind of show like or gauge the POPs like intensity. And also, just if you measure the amount of POPs as well, that would just show. Um, I guess I also wanted to add that a, if you guys don't know what a POP is, it's just like any type of pollutant that is persistent. And so a good example of that would be DDT. If you don't know what DT, DDT is, it like has affected um, shell eggs of birds and other stuff. And also going forward, um, just kind of like lifestyle changes that we can all do is just not buying plastic items or other items that are wrapped in plastic and investing in reusable materials like glass, wood, metal, um, and also buying local. Um, it's just not really supporting like companies that are monopolizing on what we're doing and like, they don't really care about the environment. And lastly, just taking care of items that you own so that they can last five to ten years instead of like one year. That's it. Thank you. Captives, spotted rope snappers, lutanus, lutatus, 
and it's response to black soil and fly larvae and other northern foods. This is a different presentation. <laughs> um, we just use the same thing. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hola, Donny Pals. Oh, Okay, hello, good morning. I'm honored to speak with you all today about my project, which was about captive spotted growth snappers and their response to black soldier fly larvae and other novel food ingredients. So, to get the ball rolling, let's talk about aquaculture. Globally, this is a really massive food production industry. 87.5 million tons of aquatic animals are produced yearly for human consumption as of 2020. Um, that number is also expected to increase by 14% um, by 2030. So this is a massive industry. It produces half of all global seafood. It also consumes the largest share of fish meal and fish oil out of all global industries, consuming 68 and 89% of fish meal and fish oil, respectively. Just to reiterate, half of all global <laughs> seafood comes from aquaculture. And then within that, mariculture is fish farming in brackish or salty waters. So some of the pros of aquaculture are that it does not rely on wild catch, so it can rebuild overfished fisheries. It can also contribute to food security and nutrition um, for malnourished people, people who don't have access to nutritious food. And it can contribute to the economic growth and the well-being of coastal communities because it provides an alternative source of income for communities that are along the coast. Um, this is why it's important to me and to other people, especially fishermen and people who rely on the ocean for their source of income, um, to have aquaculture as an alternative because it uh, provides an alternative for fishermen and people who extract from the ocean and those stocks are depleted, so it provides additional source of fish. So narrowing the focus down to the mariculture site in Kwahini Kiel, this is an aerial picture, thank you Stephen for taking it, of the site, and you can see that there are four nets, each of which is about seven meters deep. Um, they had over a thousand fish in cultivation before Hurricane Nate. However, unfortunately, the hurricane damaged the project significantly, and three of the nets are now non-functional. Um, one of them still contains juvenile rose spotted snappers. Between 30 to 50 are in captivity, uh, this project is funded by Frank Joyce. <laughs> it is also run by. <laughs> it's run by these three amazing people who I had the pleasure of working with, Tony, Freddie, and Juan Carlos. They run the mariculture site in 24-hour shifts, so they each switch out their boats at seven. Yeah, <laughs> it was really fun to talk to them. Thank you to these people for helping me. And also a big thank you to uh, Hilbert, who is Juan Carlos' son, and um, he helped me as well. Okay, a little more on spotted rose snappers. So these are carnivorous, opportunistic fish. As you heard from Lindsay, they're trophic level four. So in the wild, they feed on shrimp, crabs, uh, the small pelagic fish, mollusks, and crustaceans. But the ones in captivity are fed primarily fish meat. So there's a project in Cape Los that feeds tuna, and in um, the mariculture site in Kwahini Kiel, it feeds the fish sardine meat. Currently, this is a really high input cost. It, uh, besides the cost of labor, it is the highest cost of the project. In Kwahini Kiel, sardines cost 1,000 colonies per kilogram. So as a result, more research is really necessary to make the project feasible um, into alternative feeds that are both appealing to the fish and economically viable, less expensive. So that leads to my question, what will the pargas eat? Um, I studied these five alternative dietary ingredients, mollusks, worms, crabs, larvae, and urchins. Primarily, I focused on black silver fly larvae. Um, it's not 100% certain that they were black silver fly larvae because we didn't have a DNA test yet, but uh, based on visual identification, I'm quite certain that's what they were. And uh, that's what I primarily focused on because there are other studies that also cite black silver fly larvae as an important novel food source. So just to reiterate, we had the soldier fly larvae, which came from a nearby farm. They were rotting, uh, they were living in rotting pineapple waste, and I did source those by hand. The crabs, <laughs> the crabs and the worms, they came from the shoreline near the site. 
And the urchins and moss were collected but in the surrounding waters. Thank you, Emmy, Jordan, and Leo for helping. Uh, so the first thing I did was set up the modules. Juan Carlos and Frank helped me to construct, um, well, clean off and implant the mini modules, as you can see here. They're made from PVC, PVC pipe, black netting, and rope. Um, they measure 1.2 meters cubed, which is significantly shallow, shallower than the Pargo's preferred depth. In the big nets, they swim at 30 feet. So it was really hard to film them in their like deeper habitat. Um, so I built these modules, I didn't build them, but I used these modules so that I could view feeding behavior with the GoPro. So Juan Carlos helped me get to <laughs> 10 juke piles. We picked the smallest ones we could find from the larger net. And then we placed five each into these two mini modules. Um, it's not pictured here, but I also placed a black plastic covering over half of the cages that the fish would have preferred sun or shade, and to simulate deeper water. Then I went and collected the larvae. <laughs> Shout out Lee for helping me find these, because they're initially they were difficult to find, but once we had the source, we knew exactly where to go. Uh, this is what it looks like to go to the farm in Kwahinikil and go dig through rotting pineapple waste. So I would collect them and then I would rinse them in salt water. Um, first fresh water and then salt water so that they would sink. And I had hundreds of them. So then I did my feeding <laughs> trials with this GoPro which was very um, agilely attached to a long stick. and. This allowed me to view the feeding behavior without disturbing the fish too much because I gently placed it in the corner of the module and then just dropped in the ingredients. So again, here are my five novel ingredients and this is a photo of what it looks like to gently drop the pieces in. This trial was actually before I had standardized my methods because I did end up leaving the black plastic covering on to minimize disturbance. The fish were also, I would categorize their behavior as timid. Um, they were really sensitive to disturbance and first few days they didn't really eat anything at all so I tried to keep conditions as standard as possible and left the black plastic on. So over my 20 trials, these are the final results. Uh, to summarize, between all five of the novel foods as compared to the control, the frozen sardine meat, they much preferred sardine meat. Um, this is because they're used to a homogenous diet of fish meat, that's what they're trained to wait for when they are fed twice a day. Um, as for the urchins and mollusks, they did not ingest any of those. And the worms, they ingested one and spit out one. The crabs, they ingested two and spit out three. And the fly, <laughs> and the fly larvae, they ingested four and spit out 12. So that's an eaten to rejected ratio of one quarter. Let's dive into the data a little more, because it's actually a little more complicated than that. I focus primarily on fly larvae, as I mentioned, and I split the feeding trials into two distinct categories. As you can see here, we have maggots that are whole and maggots that are visually and physically modified. So the whole ones, they were either plain or they were soaked in sardine juice to make the smell and taste of fish meat. And then the modified ones, I had scraped the guts out, so it's just the protein-rich skins, and also some that were mashed up to emulate the texture of fish meat. And if you draw your attention to the section of the graphs that depicts larvae eaten versus larvae rejected, you can see that the whole maggots that were visually unmodified um, had absolutely zero in ingestions. Um, they were all spit out. The ones that were visually modified, though, had four in each case that were actually eaten and swallowed. So there were also two here who they were ingested, but um, the fish swam out of the frame, so I was not able to determine the final, final result of what happened to the, in that case. So those are an unknown outcome. But we have a 100% rejection rate for whole maggots and a 4 out of 7 or 57% rejection rate, which is much lower for the visually modified maggots, which is a really interesting difference. So my results indicate that the fish are much more likely to ingest visually modified fly larvae. Um, and this is promising because it shows that with some modification, black silver fly larvae could be used in the feed of rose spotted snappers. They are also used already commercially in the feed of um, many other different kinds of farmed fin fish like salmon, tilapia, catfish, sea bass, sturgeon fish. Um, and those are successful trials that have no impact on the digestion rate or the gut health or the survival rate of the farmed fish. 
So in conclusion, we can safely say that snappers don't eat whole larvae, but they might eat them <laughs> if they're modified visually and physically. Um, I would suggest further studies that go into modifying the larvae, such as grinding them up into flour or um, a paste and maybe mixing them with fish oil. Okay, that's all. I didn't list people by name, but thank you to everyone that was there, and um, especially the Mariculture guys, they were really helpful. <laughs> more higher acceptance of that feed. Is he? Uh, how many of the fish did you have in each of the cubes and how big were they? Um, five in each module. They were juveniles, so they were on the smaller side. Um, yay big. <laughs> yeah. Um, do the mariculture guys know your results and do you think that they're going to Potentially, I told them I will send them my project, which I do intend on doing when it's, it's finished. finished. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's also a mariculture site in Capos, which I didn't have time to include, but they are the only company in the world that's commercially farming rose pod snappers, and they feed different diets at different life stages. Um, but like I mentioned, there are studies for carnivorous fish that are being fed fly, black soldier fly larvae as a partial substitution of their diet, up to 50%. Replacement and it, it has no negative impact on growth rate or digestion, so those are really promising. I don't know if that is a question or a comment, <laughs> but I, I really like the idea of being able to use the black soldier flies for fish. Um, it's been a little bit about the presentation before and the fact that you use some from pineapple waste. I have a question first if that was organic pineapple or not. I don't yeah. know. Okay. Frank, do you know if it was organic? I do not. And then also, um, did you use like the, the that larvae? Um, it gets harder with time. Did you try it at different stages of its life, or is it a reaction of different stages of its life? I used all ages of larvae. I just extracted what I could find and used all of it. Um, but for the different trials, there were different textures. So in some cases, they were mashed up to emulate fish flesh, and in some cases, I stripped out the innards because that's what was expected to contain the scent of the pineapple, which might throw off the pargos. So in those cases, we only used the fish skin, which is much more chewy and protein dense. So do you think if they ate something that's not pineapple and maybe something more? Yeah, actually, the studies that have been done with the black soda fly larvae um, have been shown to have really different body compositions based on the substrate that they breed in. So these were all bred in pineapple waste, which means they're going to have a little bit of a different composition than soldier fly larvae that are bred in vegetable waste, manure. They're often bred in manure for other um, farming dietary inclusion. And um, what else? Yeah, the protein content, amino acid content, and lipid content of the soldier fly larvae is really similar to that of pelagic fish. So that's what makes them a good substitute. But the way they taste and their actual um, flavor and like you mentioned the texture as well is influenced by the substrate that they breed in. Did you consider chasing a larvae to find out if you I would I wanted Frank to and Frank <laughs> wanted to, but um they have a lot of bacteria and then being on a farm uh, really close to cow manure makes them not a great thing to eat raw. Um, <laughs> but people do eat insects all over the world and I think it would be interesting to study <coughs> human consumption as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Okay.
session. Um, we're starting with the Mulder the Projects. Woo! Woo! Um, yeah, there you go. So this third one is Biology of Fungi and Plants. And our first speaker is Calliope Minus the mass of the dry soil. Alright, so let's get into the results. 
For the average gravimetric water content, I found that for the fungi present conditions, there was a ratio of 2.71, and for fungi absent, it was two. Now you may be thinking, this is a ratio, it's over one, does that mean there's more water than soil in this sample? But no, it just means that there's more water than dry material in the sample. So for average percent water content, I found that there's 68.6% water in the sample for fungi present and 63.4% for fungi absent. So what do these results show? You may have noticed that there is a higher amount of water in the soil for fungi present conditions. However, it is not a statistical difference enough to say there's a correlation. So there's no correlation between the amount of water in the soil when the saprophytic fungi are present. But why? One reason could be because there's mycelium in the soil. So mycelium are the root-like structures of fungus, and you may not be able to see them because they're in the ground and they're really tiny, but they are what's doing the rotting. So all of these fungi that I studied had mycelium in them. It could also be due to some abiotic factors. So for rainfall, I collected my samples on different days, so they may have had different amounts of rainfall for each day. And there could have been different exposure to sun for each sample, depending on the coverage above them. So what else could I do with this study? I could measure the water content over time. And doing this, I'd be able to look at how water changes with the growth of the fungi. And I could also account for differences in rainfall. I could also include my ceiling in my study to get a better look at the whole system of the fungi. So I just want to emphasize that these organisms are really important to the forest. Um, without them, our forest would just be piles of dead things, and I don't think any of us really want that. Um, thank you to everybody who helped me with this project. Naomi was especially helpful, and Ava for helping me with my data. And thank you all for listening.
lunch is here, and it, I think it will just be better if we go ahead and eat. Okay. I apologize. <laughs>
fungi and plants. And our next speaker is Amanda Edmonds from UC Santa, Bar Santa Barbara. And she <laughs> she's going to talk to us about fern mycorrhizae. Wow. Yeah. All right, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about the differences in the mycorrhizal colonization of rhizomes in terrestrial and epiphytic ferns. Okay, so basically, mycorrhizae is a type of fungi that has a symbiotic relationship with plants, and it'll, it's different depending on the type of mycorrhizae, but the kind we're looking at today, uh, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, will form these like structures called arbuscles, which are like specialized hyphae, which are basically like, like fern roots, and they'll go into the cell wall of plants, and it like increases gas exchange and nutrient exchange and stuff. And this is a symbiotic relationship where both parties like benefit from it. And basically the fungi will break down nutrients in the soil that are harder for the plant to do for itself. And the plant will usually get phosphorus or other nutrients from it. And they'll also get protected from parasitic fungi. And in turn, the fungi will receive organic carbohydrates from the photosynthetic plant. And this like relationship goes back way back to the earliest plants, and it was used by the earliest plants to colonize land when there were no other plants like on land, you know? And this includes ferns, because ferns are a primitive group that have ancestors like that go back to 360 million years ago. And there's fossil evidence that ferns used, um, that had relationships with things resembling and fungi um, that they used to like, like survive and get nutrients and stuff. So this should be expected to like, through. And basically ferns are um, members of the polypodiophyta division and they're defined as being vascular plants that reproduce with spores instead of seeds and flowers. And they like damp and shady habitats and they can live in the ground terrestrially or on rocks or like on other plants as epiphytes. And so little is known about the relationship between ferns and mycorrhizae and um, only 68% of the ferns studied today have um, seem to have mycorrhizal relationships, which is a lower percentage than all other groups of vascular plants. And um, so this suggests like an evolutionary disadvantage to like lose that association, but people don't really know why. And also it's important to note that the ferns that do have mycorrhizae are facultively mycorrhizal, which means that it's not like a compulsory relationship and like they can survive without it. Um, so little is known, but there are some observed patterns that have been seen where the ferns that have mycorrhizal relationships um, have been seen to have a lower biomass, which goes into the high carbohydrate cost and like having to give excess carbohydrates to 
um, the fungi that they can't use for themselves, and also elevation. Higher elevations have been seen to correlate with lower mycorrhizal associations. Soil nutrients, um, it has been seen that less nutrients in soil has correlated to higher mycorrhizal associations because there's a higher need <coughs> for nutrients. And then also what we'll be looking at today, terrestrial versus epiphytic, um, a lot of studies have seen that terrestrial ferns have higher rates of um, mycorrhizal associations than epiphytic ferns because there's a common fungal um, or a common mycorrhizal partner called glomerulum mochaida, and it needs stable soil conditions to survive. So that would explain that. So that takes us to my central question: To what extent is the mycorrhizal colonization of rhizomes and ferns different between epiphytic and terrestrial individuals? And so for my methods, I collected a total of 30 individuals, and I took three root samples from each, so then I ended up in 90 total samples that I analyzed. Um, 15 of the individuals were epiphytic, 15 were terrestrial, and to avoid bias, I identified them on the family level after collection, and I ended up um, identifying about eight total families. And these were also taken from half and half at two different sample sites, one up by the Estación Biológica, which is at um, 15, 50 meters of elevation, and it's mostly intact forest, but also there's some parts that have been, they used to be pastures, but they've been rehabilitated for about 45 years. And then back here at the Dwight and Rachel Crandall Reserve, which is a little bit lower at 1370 meters, and um, it's a much younger forest. When you walk around, the trees are a lot shorter. There's a lot less terrestrial plants on the ground, and there's a lot more plant debris. Um, and because it's it was rehabilitated, or started to rehabilitate 25 years ago from cow pasture. And so to stain them, I um, rinsed them gently with water and then I preserved them in 2% KOH until I was ready to stain them. And then I wrapped them in labeled coffee filters so I could like know which one was which. And they were cleared with 10% KOH for six minutes in a boiling water bath. And then immediately stained um, with a 5% lactophenol blue like calligraphy ink and vinegar solution in a water bath for three minutes. And then I also rinse them in 1% vinegar solution after that. <laughs> and then, then they're ready to be analyzed. And so I used a compound microscope and I cut samples that were about a centimeter long for consistency. And the fungal structures were stained dark. And so the arbuscles were like these like dark circular structures and then the hyphae were these like, um, like linear, like darker structures. And um, I counted the amount of arbuscles present and then determined on a scale from like zero to five, the percent of colonization, um, like five being 100%, but I don't think I got any more over three or two. Um, and then for statistics, I used two-tailed t-tests with a significance level of 0.05. So here's an example of some of um, the roots that I found that had uh, mycorrhizae. Like this one, you can see a really good example of um, like a hyphal network, and it's kind of hard to see, but you can see some arbuscles in there. Same with the middle one, there's some arbuscles in there, and then you can see a good uh, high favorite right there. And so of the 90 samples, I found mycorrhizae in 35, or 38.9% of them. And of the 30 individuals, there were 13 that had mycorrhizae, or 43.3%. And this graph kind of depicts the number of plants um, per study site, and then separated by terrestrial and epiphytic ones. And you can see that there were no terrestrial ferns at the Estacion that had mycorrhizae in them, so. Um, this one I won't go into too much, but it's the, the eight families that I collected, how many plants were in each family, and then you can compare that to the proportion of individuals in each family that had mycorrhizae. And so there's three families that didn't have any mycorrhizae at all, and you can kind of see like a distinction between it looked like families either had only terrestrial or only epiphytic ones with mycorrhizae, which is something interesting. And so then this is the average number of arbuscles found per rhizome sample, separated again by study site and then by dwelling type. But none of these, neither of those were significant p-values. Um, but over here, look, look at the average degree of colonization found per rhizome sample by study site and dwelling type. Um, there is a significant difference with a p-value of uh, 0.018 in comparing the dwelling types. So there were significantly less um, terrestrial ferns that had mycorrhizae in them. And then also 
um, looking at the study site in that one, there's a p-value of 0.057, which isn't quite significant, but I still looked at the possibility of that being significant and considered it like marginally significant. And so I found the average percent of mycorrhizal colonization to be significantly lower in the terrestrial ferns, um, which could suggest an advantage of mycorrhizae in epiphytic species. And there's a couple reasons that I think that could be. Um, epiphytes have higher access to sunlight, so they'll have more carbohydrates that they're producing and they'll be able to give off more. And then also epiphytes aren't connected to the soil, so they're, they have to have special mechanisms to get access to more nutrients, so mycorrhizae could be one of them. Unfortunately, this does negate previous studies, so that either suggests limitations in my own study, or like such as a small sample size, or perhaps other studies, or just maybe it's just not a very well known thing. So there's like phenomenon, phenomenon that we don't know about yet. And um, again, there was a marginally significant difference in the percent of colonization between the two study sites, which I think could one be due to the change in elevation because the estacion at the higher elevation had less mycorrhizae, which has been backed up by previous studies. Um, and then there was also differences in the forest age, which um, we, I wasn't able to take any soil samples, but that would be something really interesting to look at because I think with the higher amount of clutter and like, um, like de uh, detritus on the forest floor, it seemed like there could have been a lower cycling of nutrients and, um, or no, there could have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so perhaps the, the rehabilitating soil was more like nutrient lacking and therefore had a higher percent of mycorrhizae. And so basically this is important because um, there was a study this year that looked at um, how ferns are being affected by climate change and it's difficult because um, I learned that they're just like such a big diverse group and so a lot of the changes were very like species specific and I feel like mycorrhizae and like that relationship could fit into that and if more is known about like which plants have mycorrhizae and why then maybe we could start to predict how specific species will react to climate change and changing habitats and stuff so yeah so I'd like to thank everyone that helped me especially my host mom and nice and all my advice and everything and yeah based off of proximity to the trail I was on and also to the ground. So um, I just got ones that I was able to like reach myself and I tried to get like a diverse group and get ones that appeared different and then I went and collected the terrestrial ones after that and would kind of do them in pairs to like for consistency. So I would collect an epiphytic one and then I would like collect a terrestrial one like close by. Selena? I don't, again, sorry. Hey, just, I have a question. So basically what's happening is that ferns that have less access to nutrients will um, have some sort of a relationship with mycorrhizae in order to access the nutrients, mm -hmm. right? So what do you think this could be like a, when it comes to climate change? Do you think um, being able to create these uh, relationships according to their needs? Would mean that they're also like more resilient to things like climate change, or it's possible. Um, there's also a lot of possible disadvantages to the relationship, such as like if um, the plant doesn't have as much access to sunlight, then like the uh, the, the fungi taking the carbohydrates from it like might just end up hurting it more than it's benefiting it. Um, so it's probably just different based on the species and like where it is also. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. <coughs> Any other questions? Mac? Favorite part of the project? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I liked going on the little hikes to find all my plants. Um, and I also liked finding the mycorrhizae because Mac helped me a lot and knows the <laughs> process. And it was 
long days in the lab sometimes where we didn't find much, but when we found it, it was it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Frank? I know this wasn't um, specifically part of your study, but do you have a sense of how the mycorrhizal spores are moving around? Moving around in the in the root? Or no, in the sorry, rhizome? like getting uh, spread throughout the environment. So like up a tree or down from a tree or getting from this spot to that spot. Do you have any idea how that occurs? I don't know enough to really talk on it, but I do remember seeing studies that um, looked at uh, mycorrhizal colonization in like the, the spores and like the gametophyte um, tissue and stuff. But yeah, I don't like remember it super well, but I think it like kind of stays with them. Like it like stays on, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Thank you. Because the branch 
is a horizontal uh, area and it has more abundant moisture and other plants establishing other epiphytes and lichens creating more of a canopy mat where uh, there's more nutrients and moisture. Whereas on the trunk, it's a little bit more kind of out in the open. It's just collecting all the nutrients it can, all the water it can collect while it hangs out there. Um, I also looked at individuals at different heights on the tree. I think the lowest was about five meters and the highest was a little over 25 meters. Um, and then I also looked across different genera because I couldn't really collect from just one and I wanted to see how it was distributed more widely. So here I am, <laughs> hopped up in a tree with some really awesome local people. Um, I collected the roots here, put them in these little containers, brought them into the lab and stained them again with the vinegar um, ink solution. I used coffee filters to keep them separate so I knew which was which. I also took photos while I was up in the tree to then later go back and identify them. Um, so same with Amanda, I did have three pieces for each individual, so I had quite a few slides to look at. This is just one tray, for example. Um, and then I stuck them under the microscope and looked for structures. I looked for um, hyphal growth and arbuscule, or no, I looked for vesicles uh, rather than arbuscules. They're a little bit easier to identify. So what I found was statistically nothing crazy. Um, <laughs> Because I had such uneven sample sizes for each of these variables, um, statistically speaking, nothing came up super different or um, variable. But on these graphs, visually, it looks like Vriesia, this genus, has a little bit more colonization in both the trunk and branch. Um, and then it kind of goes down. This genus here um, has been known to uh, have the association previously in studies. Um, but and it's, yeah, it's hard to make judgments visually because it's a little deceiving. Um, as for the average vesicle count, oh yeah, this is the root colonization category here on this axis. And then um, over on this guy, we have the average vesicle count. Um, and there was a little bit more found on branch individuals, um, but I did, again, not see anything numbers wise. <laughs> Uh, so this is just an example of what I was looking for. It's kind of to show how minuscule this organism is. Um, it's, this is a vesicle, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting. This is also not as magnified as it could be. Um, but another thing that I found that was really interesting is that I recognized here that there's two different types of hyphae growing. So this uh, bee is gonna be the arbuscular mycorrhizae, which is blue and it's supposed to be stained by the blue, while the other one is a little bit lighter colored and looks different. And after I started to see it a lot, I was like, something's going on in there. Um, and that is a different root fungi called dark septate endophyte. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that later here, I guess. Um, <laughs> so just to wrap it all up to see kind of what's happening and why this all matters, um, I did see a lot more structures than I expected to see because like I said, previous studies haven't really found it that much. Um, so I was surprised to see uh, the structures in almost half of my individuals that I sampled. Um, again, there was slightly a difference between um, genera, but because I didn't get enough from each one, there wasn't anything to kind of hold on to there. Um, but it's interesting to think about because different individuals or different genera might have different um, adaptations to these conditions and might not necessarily need our muscular mycorrhizae to survive here. Um, so then to get into the uh, dark septate endophyte again, this is a fungi that's different than mycorrhizae. It does have similar um, importance. It has more saprotrophic genes, so it actually breaks down the plant mat matter around um, the epiphytes or other plants to make that nutrients available for the plant without having um, like a more specific mutualism going on there, um, which is really interesting because a lot of the canopy environment has different like matter buildup, but it's not, the nutrients isn't available for the plants to actually use. 
So it's really important to kind of bridge the gap of why there's like dead decaying matter there, but why the plants can't actually use it. So, and it's also interesting that both of these fungi were found together um, because they could also be having some sort of relationship there as well, like more separately. Um, so overall, this topic is still really open-ended. We're not really sure why the mycorrhizae is here and not there. Um, but I think for future studies to get into that and to maybe nail down the, the variables a little more specifically and get a bigger sample size would be really awesome. Um, so yeah, just a thank you to all my instructors, especially Naomi for guiding me through this, uh, and all my peers for just supporting me and everyone else through this process, Amanda for being my lab buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you so much. to grow and to exist so that's like more of a like obligatory association whereas with other plants it's kind of like okay you can live in me and I'll take you because you're gonna help me too but I don't necessarily need it okay yeah yeah okay. and like this diagram back here is really cool too because it shows that like the spore will just be hanging out there mm -hmm. this actually isn't really that good because it shows that the mycelium <laughs> starts growing before it gets into the plant which isn't really what happens, but it is nice to show that it actually penetrates the root cells. Got it. Yeah. Rich, how is the process of um, looking for the mycorrhizae? Like, did you hit a point where you were like scared you wouldn't be able to find it or didn't know if it even existed? Like, yeah, it was really tedious in the whole process, but I did uh, do like some observations before actually going up into the trees and getting these because um, I was really worried. I was like, maybe I shouldn't even do this because I might not find it at all. Um, but I did find it in, I would say, I, I found it in enough the very first observation around to know that I could go forward with the project, but it's definitely that thing of like, I'm only seeing the structure, like what if this isn't actually what it is? Um, but once you start to see and like make that image in your head, you know what you're looking for and you know like what you're finding. Busy. Uh, Mine is kind of similar um, to Rachel's, but uh, how did you know that the vesicles were worth a part of and then they're actually in the Yeah, so again, um, I looked at like tons of pictures to kind of make that comparison for sure, but like you'll see a blue dot or something that looks different, like it will look more see-through than this little ball. This is really hard to see what's actually happening. But like something like this, for example, isn't a vesicle because it's like it's like clear kind of compared to this is a more like solid structure. Um, and there is a lot of like random things that you look at in the microscope in the root and you're like, well, is that it or is that not it? But it's really just like once you decide on what you're gonna observe, like that's gonna be it. And like. Um, it's a little complicated with this specifically because you can also DNA sequence to guarantee that that's the mycorrhizae you're finding um, because there's other fungi that create structures similar to our vascular mycorrhizae that are like saprotrophic or even sometimes like parasitic to the plant. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answered, but. Ava, um, did you find the like other type on the multiple sample? I did find it on multiple. I didn't record every time I found it because at first I thought it was just like not stained properly or it was just like a piece of the root that got cut or I wasn't really sure until I like saw it a few times and then was like, let me like 
look it up or see like what else this could be and then I was like that's definitely what it is and there are some studies out there that look at both of the fungi um, in certain plants or like, certain specific crops even um, but it was really just like noticing that there was something else going on and being like okay now I know <laughs> it was a little too late though <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, so we're going to continue, obviously, on the program that says that we're going to have lunch, but we already did, so we're going to continue. Um, now our next speaker is Lynn Jung from UC Santa Barbara, and she's going to talk about orchids on... Um, conifers and native Hi, um, as Naomi said, my name is Lynn Jung. I'm from over at UC Santa Barbara. Go Chos. <laughs> <laughs> my project looked at whether orchids in Monte Verde grow on conifers. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but we'll get into it. To start out, Orchidaceae, for those who don't know, is a very, very large and diverse plant family of monocots, and they show a high degree of species richness. This is due to orchids being very specialized to their particular niche. Niche? Sorry. Uh, many of them are really diminutive and sort of hard to see. They tend to be very limited in their range when it comes to individual species as well, because they disperse with wind, um, their seeds are very small and they just kind of scatter. And I think out of like five million seeds on average per fruit, maybe five percent actually turn into plants, which is pretty small. Um, the high speciation is a really interesting trait of this family. And again, going back into the niche thing, many require really specific factors to actually flourish and thrive. And so this includes, but is not limited to, the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, as my peers have discussed a little bit before, um, the availability of water and light, and very specific pollinator relationships as well. So basically, orchids as a group have evolved to fulfill a set of very specific niches and in very specific ranges. And what that means is, for my study, is that there will be habitats that are not suitable for them. And because Monte Verde is home to conifers, which were planted maybe 30, 40 years ago by people seeking to use them as lumber, there's this presence of non-native trees within this area. So I basically wanted to see if orchids were present, abundant, and species rich on these conifers as opposed to native trees. And so the question I came up with is, are epiphytic orchids, or orchids that grow on plants, more abundant and species rich when growing on native trees as opposed to conifers? So for this study, my materials and methods were actually pretty straightforward. I kept it simple. I like to hike, so I would gather my supplies for the day, which would usually be a tape measure, a notebook, and some form of orchid identification system, like a field guide. Sometimes I'd just take pictures as well and do it after. That was usually more comfortable, I found. And then I'd go out and locate 10 conifers and 10 native trees at each site. And then I would carefully count and record the abundance and number of species of orchids uh, growing on each tree. Because it was difficult to identify orchids that weren't in flower, I would typically use traits such as like pseudobulbs, fruiting bodies, leaves, leaves and stems, just anything to differentiate them rather than necessarily identify them. And the three sites I chose were Bajo del Tigre, the Monte Verde Institute, and the Estación Biológica. So I would go around the area sort of loosely and look for my trees for the day. And my results were pretty much in agreement with my hypothesis, which was that Yes, orchids are less species rich and abundant on these conifers. At two of the three sites, so at the Estación Biológica and the Monte Verde Institute, species richness was significantly higher. I didn't show the p-value here, but I also ran a two-tailed p-test, or six of them, actually. Oh. <laughs> In Excel, it's pretty easy. Um, and I found a significant difference, essentially, between 
species richness of orchids on conifers and natives at these two sites, and the same applied for abundance as well. And you can kind of also see, like, when it's visualized, these would be my conifers and these would be my natives. Obviously, there's more orchids on the natives. Um, the third site was Bajo del Tigre, and this did not have a significant difference or showed any sort of significant relationship. I think this is due to a couple of factors. I wasn't really expecting this, but I was in the neighborhood mm -hmm. instead of the reserve, so where Frank lives. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of fenced off, and some of the trees had like maybe been cut relatively, like, relatively recently, so there might have been a higher level of disturbance in the area, so that could have affected things. Uh, in the end, I really only found two trees out of 20 total on the site that had any orchids at all, one native and one conifer, so that could be an outlier. And yes, as I discussed, there are all these factors at Bajo del Tigre that made it sort of interesting, but overall I can pretty comfortably say that there was a significant difference and that orchids seem to like native trees more, that they may have evolved alongside, as opposed to conifers that are sort of a new introduction to the area. And then future study topics that I think could maybe take this question along a little further and that I wish I'd gotten the opportunity to maybe delve into um, was just maybe taking a look at what biotic and abiotic factors make it so difficult for orchids to grow on conifers specifically or establish on conifers. This could have something to do with the chemistry of the plant or even just the texture of the bark, the location, um, <coughs> the presence of mycorrhizal fungi. There's so many different things that could affect this. And then I did notice, like as you saw from my data, there were orchids growing on some of the conifers. And I did notice a couple of species were more common on them. This wasn't, this isn't a conclusion I came through to through mathematics, but just from observation. And so looking into what traits allow them to persist on these maybe less suitable habitats and if they'll persist in other challenging environments. I don't know if anyone's ever been to the orchid garden in Santa Elena, highly recommend. Uh, but they have an orchid growing on a booth there that I found really interesting. So these plants can persist in environments that are not perfectly suited to their needs. And all right. Thank you so much. Thank you to all my peers and instructors and my host family. And that's it. Any yeah. questions? <laughs>
In, in previous presentations, we listen about micro racing. Um, have you seen something about that with respect to conifers as, as substrates? Uh, availability of fungi there? Mm. Did you find something? I didn't do anything with mycorrhizae specifically. I will say, sort of tangentially related, I noticed that there were less epiphytes overall mm -hmm. on conifers, like less bromeliads, less Ericeae, mm -hmm. just everything but everything. the moss. Yeah. So not only orchids, also bromeliads? Yes, from my very mm -hmm. like, overlying observations. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Lynn. <laughs>
results, we can go ahead and look at this first graph up here first. So these bottom ones, it's really hard to see, but they're the um, different tree species, color-coded by species. And then the black horizontal lines are the average of the three individuals per species. And the y-axis is um, the percent change of bark moisture. So for the bark moisture, I found that there was a significant difference between tree species. And the reason for this is because um, bark, the bark of different trees is made up of different components, or not the same components, but in different amounts for each tree. So that variation contributes to different amounts of water that could be absorbed by each tree bark <laughs> for different species. Yeah. And then this other graph shows a scatter plot of the average bark moisture on the bottom and the average moss cover on the y-axis for all 10 tree species. And with this graph, I could see that there was actually no correlation between moss cover and bark moisture. So that was different than what I was expecting my results to be because I hypothesized that with more bark moisture, you would see more moss cover. So going on to why isn't the moss more selective to trees with higher bark moisture? I have a few hypotheses for this. The first one is that moss is actually like not affected at all by bark moisture and it just doesn't care about bark moisture at all. Um, the other one is that um, moss on trees with greater bark moisture is moister or healthier than other moss. Um, so I didn't look at the moistness or health of the moss, I just counted if it was present or absent. So that could be a factor that differentiates the moss on different tree species. Another idea is that maybe moss is more selective in drier areas. Um, in this forest, it's pretty humid, so it could be that the moss just doesn't rely on the bark moisture as much as a source of water, but maybe in other areas um, that are more dry, it could rely more heavily on bark moisture. And that led me to this other idea that was maybe moss could become more selective towards trees with higher bark moisture in the future due to climate change. If it dries out the air in the forests, it could lead to um, more selective moss. And then going on to why do we care about bark moisture? Um, well, bark moisture of different trees since it is um, variable between tree species, it has the possibility of creating microclimates between the trees. So if we have two areas, this one being an area of trees with high bark moisture, and this one being an area of trees with low bark moisture, they could have um, different microclimates between the two. Um, and then as climate change, comes along and contributes to uh, changing the hydrology in the cloud forests. Um, it could cause <coughs> differential effects of these two microclimates and further differentiate these areas within the same forest. And that might be important for considering future conservation of areas and predicting where species might need to migrate towards in the future. And just to finish it off, future research, I think it'd be really exciting to expand the scope of the study to include more tree species and more trees. Um, revisiting moss coverage in the future to see if it has moved at all to trees with higher bark moisture. And then just looking more into how bark moisture affects climate change. And then I want to thank my host mom medium, Naomi, Eladio, and Clappy for helping me with my data collection, and everyone else as well for listening. <laughs>
testing the bark for moisture, that was testing to see how much the how much water the bark is able to absorb and retain. Um, um, how did you determine which square bark? I looked for a bark that had um, not a lot of moss on it because moss also absorbs a lot of water. So I think that would have affected the weight. So I looked for basically um, pieces that had no moss, and I tried to like space it out mm -hmm. around the tree. Cool. So deep. How deep does bark go into the trunk, and does that vary among different species? That does vary among different species. So um, I don't know exactly. It does vary a lot. Um, some of the pieces that I took were pretty thick, and some of them were like really thin, just depending mm -hmm. on like how much bark wanted to come off. So, <laughs> Sarah. Do you know if you were, if the moss was the same species on all the trees, or is there like a lot of different types of moss? I don't know. I started trying to identify the moss, and that was just too much. <laughs> so, I did see some different kinds, but I'm not sure what they were. Calliope. Will the bark you got from the trees ever grow back? <laughs> um, so, yeah, the trees grow like secondary growth is like wide, they grow outwards. So it will, it won't um, ever like re like form that hole, but it will like reform new layers of bark in the future. Good. Your idea to evaluate the health of the moss, how can you do that? Or what are you thinking? Um, just seeing, try, trying to see if the moss, like how moist it is, or if it's more dry, um, could be one way to test how healthy it is. Frank? Is it possible that the moss actually rips moisture and water from the bark, so you actually find uh, a result opposite to what you expect? Um, in that case, I would have expected to see more of like a negative correlation between like moss cover is more correlated to lower bark moisture, but I found kind of more of a neutral correlation. Um, I think more study could see if that's the case. Any other questions? Thank you, Ava. <laughs>
In my diagram, take a look at A and B. Those two letters are very important, so just burn into your brain that A is the above ground portion of your metaphor, and B is below ground, because I'm going to throw that around a lot. I took my data in the Las Salinas Mangrove Restoration Project. Specifically where the red arrow is, it was a region that didn't have many plants, because for my data collection, it was important that I look at one plant without anything around it. Because as you saw in the previous photo, pneumatophores, you can't really tell which plant they come from unless you only see one. And I wanted to know the parent plant. So how I did my data collection. I would go out, I would find a tree that was on its own, and I would mark the cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. Then I would take a tape measure, measure half a meter from the center trunk, and take the eight clotus pneumatophores as my sample on each side, north, east, west, south. Then I would use a tape measure, measure the top part, and then get really muddy, lay on my stomach with a trowel, and dig all the way to the horizontal root. In doing that, I would get a notebook that looked kind of like this. The bunch of different numbers. The left side meaning the height above ground, the right side meaning the height below ground. So the way I'm going to present my results is talk about what exactly I found and then why that's important, because it's easier to understand when I pair the two together. So the first graph I have to show is a scatter plot with all 320 pneumatophore points that I collected. So the important thing to first look at is the distribution of the data. Since the bottom data, or I guess the height, first off the y-axis pneumatophore height above ground, x-axis is below ground. Since the distributions aren't perfectly symmetric, I use the median as my type of central tendency, just so I don't skew any variables. What I noticed is that my below ground median was higher than my above ground median. Basically, that means that more biomass of the pneumatophore lives below ground, as opposed to the above ground part. Which is interesting, because when you look at a pneumatophore, you only see the top part. One factor to consider, oh, before I lose my train of thought, it's very important to notice that I did run a Pearson's correlation coefficient test and found a very small correlation coefficient. So correlation coefficients range from 0 to 1, or negative 1, and I found a negative correlation of 0.207. Basically, that means there isn't necessarily a certain pattern in which pneumatophores grow. You might think that, oh, half a meter must live below the ground, so then they're going to grow half a meter above the ground. Not necessarily the case. But let's talk about why. So one role that's very important to consider is the biotic factors. So storms can totally change the soil topography. Also, tide. Mangroves live in an area where the tide is constantly washing in and out. It's important to remember that I conducted my data at the very end of the wet season, beginning of dry season, so everything I learned was very specific to this moment in time. But it is a good start. There's something else I noticed while I was taking my data points, and it is that some pneumatophores have more than one tip, known as the apex. So, I took a pneumatophore <laughs> for you all to see. It looks like this. This is a pneumatophore that has more than one apex. And as you can see, the points are what extend above ground. This is how the oxygen comes into the soil. So I looked at the 47 data points that only had, or that had more than one apex, anywhere from two to four, or five. And I found something really weird, is that the correlation is much different than what I found for the 320 total data points. As you can see, the correlation coefficient R is positive, 0.61. And, you know, it's still not the strongest, but it gives some sort of implication that it could be the longer the below ground height, the taller the above ground height. Now, why is that important? Well, if a pneumatophore is allocating energy to having more than one tip peak out of the soil, it means like it's going to get there because it knows it's spent time energy into this pneumatophore and that it's going to have more oxygen available to come into the plant. Therefore, that's potentially a reason why the plant would spend more energy and have more of a correlation, more of a pattern found in the way it allocates growth. So this is my last diagram to take in. These are all 320 data points organized in a different fashion. I took each pair, which consisted of the above and below ground part of the new map for, but I organized it in terms of above ground height only, from the smallest height to the tallest height. But when you look at zero, zero is the soil line, and then you compare what the below ground root structures look like, you kind of see a little wavy pattern, like an oscillation. And that's very interesting because you can have a small or tall pneumatophore height, 
But it doesn't mean that if you're getting a small height, that you also have to get a small bottom. You can have a small bottom or a big bottom. And that trend, <laughs> that trend extends all the way throughout the line, which is really crazy. So I know it's really weird that I spent time covered in mud looking at new metaphors, but there's some really important reasons why we should understand these structures and appreciate them more. One man a while ago named Scholander found that if you took away all of the nematophores in an Avicennia germinans plant, that the oxygen content of the plant would reduce to below 1%. So basically, these finger-like projections are very necessary for the plant survival. Well, nematophores are structural adaptations to allow these mangroves to survive. And although we didn't find that there's necessarily a specific pattern in the growth allocated to you know, letting mangroves live and breathe, each mangrove that I mangrove new metaphor that I studied did come out of the ground. And one final thing that I thought about and that I noticed is that mangroves didn't necessarily have to make their new metaphors super tall to be effective. They just needed their new metaphors to come and be exposed to air so they could get oxygen. And that, sure, things are going to change. The topography is going to mix, but as long as enough lenticels are exposed above that the mangrove will be happy to have allocated energy to that function. Yeah. Anyway, I want to say a special thank you to a couple of my assistant friends who came and sat in the mangroves for four hours with me while I dug around, to Frank and Maria Marta for their advice, and for my awesome <laughs> helpers, Midaya and Ivania, who laughed at me and somehow thought when I said datos, I was talking about gatos, which wasn't the case. And special thanks to my parents who came here in 1996 and 1997 and encouraged me to study abroad in Costa Rica. <laughs>
data, so I couldn't definitively say anything, but everything that I did see was interesting in helping us ask questions and find answers. Other questions, please? Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but what about members who live close together today? Other share groups? So the mangroves that live close together, it's more so that their horizontal roots will just intertwine, which is part of why I took my samples the way I did to just have like a very isolated tree. So I could say that like all of these data points came from this tree, especially if my trees weren't the same age and I found something very different. I didn't want to confuse and just take new metaphors from all over. But when you look at mangroves that are really close together, like in this, and right, you can see a bunch of different tree trunks all around. There is no way to tell which one comes from which. Even sometimes ones that seem like they're right next to the trunk could be a horizontal root, like kind of bypassing the plant. Sophie? I think your drawing addressed this, but um, the metaphors are the openings, like the pores where the gas exchange happens just at the tip, or is, are all of those dots along the length of the metaphor also? All of the dots okay. are also um, lattice cells, is what so, they're called. Okay. And so the interesting thing is when you look at a new metaphor, and if you take a look at mine, they kind of start around here. So they start at the like, first opening where gas exchange can occur and go all the way to the top. Um, it's unclear if they do extend all the way to the bottom just because of the way the topography changes, but at least in the one that I brought in today, it just started right around the line of soil. Other questions? Thank you, Brad. Our next speaker is Annie Liu from UC. She's gonna talk about things that we have not talked about at all today, um, and it's. Um, it has to do with decomposition and growth. My project was on the effects of indigenous microorganisms on lactic acid bacteria and plant growth and decomposition. So, some background information. We often think of soil as a medium for plant growth, but on its own, it's a really important habitat for diversity of microbes. So the wide range of pore sizes in soil provides niches and protective hiding spaces for microbes from fungi, bacteria, and protozoa to mesofauna like nematodes. Um, and they all take part in the soil food web, which includes decomposition of organic matter, cycling of nutrients, and sequestering carbon in that process. And these microbes have a variety of benefits in the soil, including building the soil structure because they excrete compounds that move the soil particles together. And they also suppress plant pathogens by competition and predation. So overall, they're really important for soil health and plant health. However, the most important method that farmers use to fertilize soil is with chemical fertilizers. And actually, only 60 to 90 percent of that, 60 to 90 percent, is lost in the environment. Um, so while there, it can contribute to water pollution and air pollution, it can lead to soil degradation, and it has a negative impact on human health. It's also an external input that farmers need to purchase, so make, it can make them vulnerable to um, an external input and economic volatility. In contrast, Korean natural farming is an approach to organic farming that uses really accessible and simple household materials. Um, so for example, some basic jars, sugar, raw milk, which is what I use. Um, and it's all found in this recipe book that you can find online. It was developed by Master Ham Kyu Cho in South Korea. And it's been practiced for decades across Asia and in Hawaii. Um, it's decentralized, it's really adaptable and approachable, and it's not only ecologically, but also socially and economically sustainable. Um, however, there isn't much data on how effective these recipes actually are. So my question was, what are the effects of indigenous microorganisms lactic acid bacteria on plant growth and decomposition. Um, my methods, so basically for my IMO solution, I cooked rice. I buried it in soil to attract indigenous microorganisms. I mixed that with sugar um, for a sustainable food source, and then diluted that with water before I applied it to my CQ plants. 
the allowed solution was using that rice wash water left over from cooking rice um, and mixing that with raw milk and letting that ferment for a few days. I also mixed that with sugar for a sustainable food source and then diluted that with water before applying to plants. And my measurement of cucurbita, pepo, variety, malapepo, or zucchini um, took place in the greenhouse um, near the Eustacio. I had 30 zucchini starts, there were 10 in three groups. In the control group, I watered them with 100 milliliters of water per plant per day. Um, the IMO group had 100 milliliters of, of water diluted with the IMO solution. And the lab group had 100 milliliters of water diluted with the lab solution. And I took daily measurements of plant growth, um, which is quantified by measuring the length of the midrib of each plant leaf the number of leaves per plant, and also plant height. And at the end of the experiment, I pulled them up and measured the length of the longest root. And soil aggregate stability, which is basically putting the soil aggregate in water and quantifying how much of that falls apart. I also created two compost piles. Um, so these were organic materials left over from the kitchen at the Estacion and from my home family. Um, they were separated into two three-gallon buckets. The IMO bucket was inoculated with 10 milliliters of water with the dilution, and that was sprayed on every day. And the control bucket only had 10 milliliters of water sprayed on it. So for my results, I conducted two tailed, two sample tests that compared either the control group with the IMO group or the control group with the lab group. I found that the control group had the greatest average increase in leaf length per day. Um, these are the average values, and there was a significant difference between experimental and control group. I also found that the control group had the greatest average increase in plant height per day, and this was also a significant difference. However, the IMO and lab groups had the greatest average soil aggregate stability rating, so that means their soil aggregate was really stable and didn't fall apart in water, and this was a significant difference. Um, in addition to looking at above ground plant growth, I also looked at below ground and the average length of the longest root. And there was not a significant difference, but the lab group did have the longest root, and the control and IMO group had a similar length. For the compost piles, there was not a significant difference, but the IMO group did decrease at a faster rate than the control group. Okay. What does this mean? <laughs> Um, so I found that the control group had greater above ground plant growth, and this was contra contradictory to what I was expecting because plant groups have a lot of benefits for plants and for the soil. But prior studies have shown that the success of microbial inoculation varies based on inoculation method and abiotic conditions such as soil pH, temperature, water availability, and nutrient availability. Or it could just be that there wasn't enough time to see the full result of the plant throughout its entire lifespan. Um, but I did find that there was increased soil aggregate stability, so those are all the clumps of soil holding on to the roots. Um, and more stable aggregates could indicate greater microbial growth because these microbes produce compounds such as exopolysaccharides, which are like microbial glues that bind soil particles together. Fungal hyphae also physically tie soil particles together and can create greater aggregate stability. Um, aggregate stability is really important in agro ecosystems because they're associated with greater water filtration. So if you imagine putting an aggregate in water and having it not fall apart, that would lead to reduced soil erosion. Um, the pores in soil aggregates also hold on to carbon, so that's really important for sequestering carbon and retaining organic carbon. And as I mentioned previously, the pores are really important habitat for microbes. Um, there wasn't a significant um, difference, but the decrease in decomposition rate is consistent with other studies that found that IMOs have an increased soil organic matter contribution because they decompose organic matter and contribute to nutrient cycling. So in case you missed all that, there was a negative impact on a low ground growth and a positive impact on soil aggregate stability. Um, I also just want to mention overall that green natural farming was really flexible and accessible and adaptable. Um, and I think that's really important to give farmers agency in how they acquire their um, materials and how they relate to their surroundings. Um, 
the difference between what my data showed and what I was expecting also made me think about how important it is to be locally adapted to a region and to really have time and knowledge to acquire that information and have that in groups that are at. Thank you. Medicinal plant Cassia Mara 
and its inhibitory effects against the bacteria Escherichia coli. So, Cassia amara, um, known commonly as Almeda Grande in Spanish or as bitterwood in English, is a small understory shrub native to Central and South America. Um, now, indigenous groups from these areas have used this plant as a, what we would call now, um, traditional or folk medicine for probably thousands of years, I'm not really sure. Um, so, well, it's, it's not known, I, I looked it up. Um, so certain sets of plants have what are called secondary compounds. These are chemicals that plants create in order to defend themselves, mostly from herbivory. Hombre Grande has some secondary compounds, which at that, they're called cosinoids, cosinoids and alkaloids. And so these are the chemicals that are responsible for the plant's medicinal properties, and these are what are extracted um, as the medicine. So in Costa Rica, it is traditionally um, made into a tea. Or, so to do that, you take um, parts of the trunk and shave out little, little pieces and boil it for about 10 minutes. This is called a decoction. Um, you can pass this around. It's my experiment. Um, and then also, it's traditionally used as a tincture. So a tincture is an extract that's more than an alcohol. You soak plant matter in the alcohol for a certain amount of time. The extracts are now in the alcohol. You drink that. Um, <laughs> so that is, this is used to help with stomach aches, gastrointestinal issues, fevers, and parasitic infections. So how did I get into this plant? So I came to Costa Rica with a pre-existing interest in medicine, particularly natural medicines. Um, medicinal plants, and when it came time to choose a project, I was like all over the place. And so I talked to friends who needed help, and I told him about this interest of mine. And so he, in reverse, told me the story um, about when we were in Batia, and he came out with a little stomach problems, and Eladio came to the rescue, shout out Eladio, with a tea of Ome Grande, and Frank felt better. So I was like, heck yeah, this is dope. I'm going to be my project on this. I started researching this, and there was so much going on in that literary analysis, um, I got pretty confused from it, because first of all, different parts of the plant are used in different countries around the world. Um, the leaves are used, the roots are used, the bark from the stems, the trunk, and the roots, or the wood from all those parts, also, like all the parts of the plant are, are used. Um, this, this plant is also um, a subject of a lot of laboratory studies because it does have promising medicinal properties. Um, and in those studies, they don't really use traditional extraction methods. They use more fancier, well, fancier methods like hexane or methanol extractions. So different parts of the plant were used. Um, prepared in different methods, and there were a lot of different properties that it showed, including, um, besides the gastrointestinal properties that I talked about before, anti-malarial, anti-inflammatory, anti-ulcer, fungicidal, anti-bacterial. And so I decided to focus on the antibacterial aspect because I have a bit of a, like a background in working with bacteria and microbiology. So, all this confusion led me to <laughs> The question, will Cassia amara extracts prepared in traditional and common laboratory um, methods show inhibitory properties against E. coli? And this is a really exciting question because um, anti, so sorry, bacteria are starting to show more and more resistance to antibiotics and so um, novel uh, antibiotics, like it's important that it's important to research those and like try to find new ones. Also, it can open up resources to people who don't have access to like Western medical care and do have access to this tree. So, in order to, oh, my methods are really detailed. I'll try to go over them briefly. First, I um, collected a live sample of the branch. From this branch, I cut up pieces of fresh leaves, dried leaves, and fresh stems. And then I also used that trunk that, that a lot of trunk, I shaved off pieces from that. So I had four plant material parts. I prepared them in three different ways. So I made a water extract, a decoction, um, and like a tea. Um, a methanol extract, so this was to emulate the more laboratory methods. Um, 
I extracted the compounds using methanol. This is important. Then the methanol evaporated. Then I resuspended, so all that's left in beakers is like dried up plant compounds. I resuspended those compounds in ethanol. Yeah. Um, lastly, I used vodka to make a tincture. Okay, oh, I want to use this. Yeah. Okay, so I took E. coli and I plated it onto this jelly called Agar um, that the E. coli can grow and feed off of. And at this point, you can't really see the E. coli. Well, you can't. You can't see the E. coli. It needs to like grow and divide in order to see it. And it'll create this bacterial bond all over the agar. But before that happened, right after I put the E. coli on the agar, I took these little paper discs um, and I dumped them in each of the extracts that I made. So 12 extracts plus negative controls of just water, just vodka, and just ethanol. This is to make sure that those liquids weren't having an effect. Like any results that would come out would be from the plant off of those liquids. I also soaked them in these eardrops that contain an antibiotic. Um, this is like, this was as a point of comparison for the results, because this is definitely going to give an antibiotic result, right? So um, this is like, yeah, to compare any results I got from the plant. And then I had blank discs as well. So I dumped it all in this, and then I plated them back on the plates, and I got these plates that look like this. Because um, just to save space, I made quadrants. I placed those in the incubator for two days. Oh, and if there is an antibacterial property, um, around this white disc is going to be a circle of no bacterial growth. That is called the zone of inhibition. And voila, I got some zones of inhibition. Okay. Um, okay. Just wait, just wait. So, wait, what are these? Let's see. Mm, hold on a minute. Okay, I got zones of inhibition from the antibiotic. Good. Um, I got it from the methanol extracts of the trunk and of the dried leaves. And I also got it from the ethanol. So this is showing, these are both, um, the methanol extracts of the trunk. I did two, two trials for each extract. Um, this right here, zoomed in, is the, what is this? That's the ethanol, the bottom one zoomed in, that's the methanol extract of the dried leaves. Here is just vodka, so that did not give a zone of inhibition. Um, both the discs are vodka, and then this was the antibiotic, so you can see a really well-defined, clear, marginated circle for that, which was what I was expecting. Um, so I marked them, each extract is either yes, inhibiting with a plus, or no, not inhibiting with a minus. And then I took the means of the two, well, okay, I measured the, the zones of inhibition in millimeters. So I had two measurements for each extract, took the mean, performed a note test, and found that none of the extracts were, or none of the zones of inhibition were significantly different from each other, meaning that statistically, each of the extracts, um, resisted the bacteria as well as the antibiotic. But my negative control of ethanol showed a result. So what that means is that the two methanol extracts that are suspended in ethanol were probably from the ethanol, because the ethanol itself showed a result, not from the plant extracts. Um, yeah. So under my experimental conditions, oh my god, they did not show antibacterial properties. But my conditions were so specific, like my question was so specific, there's so much that could have been altered in my experiment. Um, there wasn't time to try, but like, I could have standardized and measured the concentration of bacteria that I put on the agar, because it's possible that there was just so much bacteria that it overpowered any of the extract's properties. I could have better standardized the concentration of the compounds in the extracts that I um, put on the discs. Um, I could have standardized the amount of extract that I put on the disc instead of just dumping it in the extract. I could have changed up the agar, I could have changed up the microbe that I tested against, it could have been a fungus, a different type of bacteria, an amoeba, like so much could have been tested. I did my experiment in this kind of unstandardized way because I was trying to emulate um, like traditional uses of this plant because when people are doing their at-home remedies, they're not going to these standardized methods are not going to be measuring out everything to like point 
hundred hundred grand and all this stuff. So I was trying to kind of figure out like how messy could I get with this and still get results basically. Um, so I still think Ombre Grande is like a really dope plant with a lot of amazing potential and I think people could, should still look into it. I think some cool things could be found out from it. Thank you all these people. <laughs>
finish this section so we can take another break. What time are we? 10, ten minute break. Okay, 10 minute break. <laughs>
no hay que hacer. ¿Dónde me tengo que ir? No para aquí. Ah, yo me veo ahí. ahí. Uh -huh. Seguimos con, con la luz apagada, ¿no? Está un poquito oscuro. Thank you very much for all the Oh! I'm just an IT person. What is that? It's like a person that does the computers. IT? Yeah. What is IT? That? I don't know. Something technician? Yeah. I didn't know it. But it's the name. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Of course. Who's next, Sam? Who's next? Sam. Okay. I think so. I think he likes like robots. Yeah. So maybe birds. Yeah. 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 Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is going to be the fifth session. <coughs> Biology of birds, mammals, and reptiles. And first speaker from Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, <coughs> Sam Everhart. <coughs> Um, thanks everyone for hanging in there. Um, my presentation will feature a lot of pictures of birds that I've taken, so don't worry, you can just look at the birds and not pay attention. That's fine. So, my title is Diversity and Composition of Avian Mixed Species Flocks Across an Elevational Gradient, um, and we'll get into what that is. So first, what are mixed species flocks? Um, what are they? Why do they form? Um, they're Basically, um, aggregations of birds of different species that come together. Um, and you have attendant species, which are birds that will join um, a species called a nucleus species. So I have pictured here a common chlorus fingus. That is um, the most common nucleus species I saw. They're a very colonial um, social bird that likes to communicate a lot together in flocks. And so when you have a flock of chlorus fingus coming along, oftentimes you will get other birds that will join in, and those are called tenant species. And reasons for why they do that, um, there's two main hypotheses. Uh, hypothesis one, protection. So um, simply by joining a flock, from the perspective of a bird that joins, um, they are decreasing the chance that they may get predated on because um, just simple probability. There's other birds to pick. Also, being in a flock, allows um, other birds to do some of the vigilance for um, in a given bird. So that's called the many eyes effect, and the birds can basically diffuse responsibility for looking for predators. Then hypothesis two, it's a little bit less stable, um, a little bit less evidence backs it up, and it's that sometimes being in a flock can facilitate foraging and increase um, the efficiency of foraging. Um, so maybe birds moving along can flush insects and make it easier for other birds to grab new insects. All right, so let's get to my question. So how do mixed species flocks vary in diversity and composition across this elevational gradient, across the um, continental divide here in the Tilaran Cordillera, um, which is the mountain range here um, in the forests of Monte Verde? And um, I divided that up into five different zones. We've got 1,100 meters to 1,350 meters on the Atlantic side. You go step up 1,350 to 1,600 meters on the Atlantic side. Then you have elevations up at the divide from 1,600 um, up to 1,850. And then you've got the same going down the Pacific. So um, let's see the next slide. What I did and where I did it, um, these five zones were across a fairly contiguous chunk of forest here 
in Monteverde or around the Monteverde area. And so the sites were um, around San Bernardo Biological Station, the Santa Elena Cloud Forest Reserve Road that goes down to the um, San Bernardo Biological Station, um, the Monteverde Estacion Biologica Trails, and then Baja Tigre Reserve. Um, and so what I did there was I would go on trails and I'd quietly walk along, I'd listen and look for flocks, and then when I encountered one, I'd start getting data. The data I collected was count of each species, elevation and GPS coordinates of the flock, and then also time and weather. So let's get into some results. I recorded data from 60 different flocks. Um, I saw more than 60 flocks, but I was able to get um, data on um, 60 flocks. Um, I would only count the data if I went a period of five minutes of watching the flock without seeing a new species. And so that was when I was confident that I had seen all of the members of that flock and got an accurate assessment of them. Um, the average birds per flock was 8.6. And across the five zones in the elevation, um, that did not vary significantly. Um, maximum number of birds I saw in a flock was 24. Um, and the average number of species per flock was 5.3. That also didn't vary significantly across the zones. Um, and maximum number of species was 16. Um, that was a pretty diverse flock. All right, so on the flock structure, um, that was kind of the second part of my question. And I found some interesting things when I broke down the flock structure. In all 19 flocks above 1,570 meters, um, the most dominant or most abundant species of bird was that common horse fingus, which I have mentioned previously. Um, those high elevation flocks also often included spangle cheek tanager and ruddy tree runner, which I don't have a picture on the slide. Um, those were kind of a typical flock that you see up the, the upper elevations, but then you come down to the lower elevations and it's really hard to characterize the flocks. Um, they generally include more migrant warblers and you start to get resident pairs of warblers. So warblers that don't migrate down here, um, they start to leave the flocks more common. Um, here's colored web start. It's a resident warbler, but it's kind of a bad example because they're high elevation species. So here's a graph of what I was talking about with the dominant species. Um, you got these middle elevations here, um, and then you got lower Atlantic, mid-Atlantic, mid-Pacific, and um, lower Pacific. And the letters down here indicate significant differences. And so basically, all the Caribbean, the Atlantic, and the Divide were significantly, or they were not significantly different. And then the Pacifics um, were um, significantly lower in terms of number of dominant species. Um, that's common chorus fingus. Obviously, that was the dominant species up at the higher elevations. And then, um, chestnut cap warbler is an example of a warbler that's resident here and is found at lower, observa or lower elevations like Bajo Tigre on the Pacific side. Long distance migrants. Um, these are migrants, um, warblers specifically, that come from North America mainly. Um, yellow warbler and golden winged warbler are common examples here. And um, you can see that with the same graph setup, um, the only significant different result that there was more migrants in the lower elevations of the Pacific in Baja Tigre. Flock diversity. Um, these are two graphs of species richness and then a functional diversity score, which I will explain quickly. Um, <laughs> in functional diversity score, is basically um, looking at the types of food birds eat and the size of the food the birds eat and um, differentiating them into the categories to say what their function in the ecosystem is. That's a short explanation, it's here. Um, so here, species richness, just total amount of species that I saw in each zone. Um, there were significantly more species in the lowlands, um, but the middle elevations and the higher elevations were all significantly the same. Um, and then going on to that, cumulative functional diversity score, um, only the Atlantic zones scored higher in terms of that cumulative amount. Interesting findings. 
Okay. Um, for another day. Um, that is wood creepers and these kind of cryptic brown birds that like to eat insects. They're hard to categorize. There's lots of species. Um, only four that I saw were not in flocks. So there's a whole 63 in flocks, and they're very common sea in flocks, and they kind of seem to be obligate flock followers. Other interesting findings. Uh, two colored trogons were a species I didn't expect to count in a flock, but sure enough, they followed the flock and moved as the flock moved, so I counted them in the flock. Um, same with two golden olive woodpeckers. There was consistent variation among the flocks, but a lot of the trends didn't change over the zones. So um, that made me realize that there's probably not an optimal flock size. There didn't seem to be any convergence to one flock size that worked well. Um, mixed species flocks around here are extremely prominent. They're very common to find as you walk around. Um, and my overlying conclusion was in the Tularon Cordillera, Cordillera Elevation mainly affects the structure and diversity of flocks as a result of changing distributions of common floor sphingus and migrant warblers. All right, um, I want to thank all these people. Um, I'm not going to name them by name because I think I might do it a little bit over time, but um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
a bit of an outline behavior where they're attracted. It's similar to flocks that form at a fruiting tree. It, they're drawn together not necessarily just for protection, but mainly because of the food source, so I wouldn't have included it. Thank you, Sam. I would like to say thank you very much to Jordan because has been working without you this symposium was not going to be going. And thank you for, for the translating of joy. Uh, next speaker from UC Santa Barbara, Rachel Frost. pollinators to many flowering species, especially those in the tropics. And some of these species have adapted specific characteristics that make them exclusively dependent on hummingbirds for pollination. And some of those traits include having a long tubular corolla that is specific to certain bill types, or often they are bright orange or red colored petals as well. Um, so artificial feeders People might put them up for a variety of reasons. Um, one might be just to attract a variety of species to their gardens to observe and admire. Um, others might be to help populations facing anthropogenic threats like habitat loss and climate change. But it's unknown exactly how artificial feeders disrupt the natural pollination relationship that hummingbirds fill. And this was something that was really interesting to me and I wanted to know um, how exactly those would affect visitation rates and pollen loads because in the past studies have shown some conflicting results. So yeah, so my central question was how do artificial feeders affect both visitation rates and the pollen loads? And by pollen loads I mean both the abundance of pollen and the general diversity of pollen found. And for diversity I grouped that based on morpho species. Um, and I will discuss that. Okay, so to study this, I chose two sites. One was cl a close site, which was at the Hummingbird Gallery, close to the Monteverde Reserve. And the other was a far site, which had one part close to the Institute and another part taking place back in the Crandall Reserve. So the first part of my study looked at flower visitations. And I did this by observing a Staphylococcus plant in both locations for one hour. And I'd alternate every other day um, based on the site. And here I would observe the number of different species that visited the flower, as well as the number of different beak inserts. And that's how I tallied up total visitation. And the second part was a pollen collection and assessment. And I did this by um, collecting pollen from the beaks and heads of hummingbirds using scotch tape, um, as shown here. And I used species that were caught in the nets from the bird banding group behind in the Crandall Reserve. And then we also set up a separate mist net close to the hummingbird gallery to see um, if there was any difference. And I assessed these under a microscope and counted, yeah, relative abundance and diversity of morpho species. Okay, yeah, so morpho species is just a grouping of biological species based on their form and structure rather than their genus and species. Okay, so my results, um, this axis might be hard to see. This is number of beak inserts, and here we have the location. Um, the galleries in red and the institute, which is the far site, is in the peach color. And what I saw was much higher rates of visitation to the Staphylococcus plant at the institute at the far site. Um, I also recorded the number of different species that visited. 
Okay, here is an overall list of species that I saw. This only includes species that were either caught in the mist nets or that I observed visiting the flowers. Um, one thing to note is that there were higher abundance of species at the gallery, um, but many of them were just visiting the feeders rather than visiting nearby plants. Um, yeah, and the bolded species are those that are unique to each site, and here we have those. Okay, and for pollen samples, these two graphs, the first one shows the overall pollen abundance, where we have number of pollen grains on the y-axis, and yeah, galleries again in red, um, institute in peach, and the second graph shows the number of different morpho species, which is on the y-axis, and what I found was statistically a significant difference between the number of pollen grains at the gallery, so it had a higher abundance at the close site, um, whereas there were more diverse species of pollen found at a far site from the feeders. Um, here are just some of the species of pollen that I saw under the microscope. This is at like 40 times magnification, um, but as you can see, they range greatly in their morphologies. Okay, so just to sum up my findings one more time, I saw lower visitations to the stacky part of the plant at the site far from the feeders. But I saw higher pollen abundance close to feeders, even though there was a lower diversity of species there. So there's a few things that could explain these results. Um, one important thing to know is that hummingbirds have different foraging behaviors. And some of them are known as trap liners, which means that they will follow a set route of visitation for the flowers that they visit. And others are known to be more territorial and will guard like, one high reward flower or a group of high nectar producing flowers. So that could have had a big impact on the different species and number of visitations that I saw because I did see a striped tail hummingbird that was visiting the Sacred Protector plant here, and it would come in rounds, and that could have increased the number of visitations. Um, but something interesting to note is that the feeders could be acting as high reward flowers, like artificial, and attracting more of the territorial species, and there could be less trap liners in those areas, resulting in lower visitations. Um, for the high pollen abundance, this, one possible explanation for this is that there are high concentrations of hummingbird visited flowers near the gallery and planted around the feeders. So one theory I have is that hummingbirds may be staying just in close proximity to the feeders and visiting flowers nearby, because that's what my data shows. Um, but the lower morpho species may suggest that they are only visiting flowers in a certain range around the feeders compared to those in the forest, which could be traveling longer distances and visiting more variety of species. Okay, so yeah, just some general conclusions. Um, visitations to some flower species could be reduced. I think in a future study it would be interesting to look at a group of flowering species rather than just one species like I did for Stachy Carpetta because I did observe some visitations at the gallery, but they were not to my plant, they were to other, other flowers. So I think that would be an interesting addition. Um, yeah, hummingbird, hummingbirds near feeders are also visiting flowers, is a big conclusion here. Um, they had high abundance of pollen, so that means that they are, in fact, pollinating or visiting flowers. Um, but yeah, they could be limiting their range because of the lower amount of morpho species. So I think another future study that could be really interesting would be to track the ranges of hummingbirds and see if those near feeders are actually limiting their geographical space that they're occupying compared to the ones in forests who are traveling farther distances. And yeah, these are my acknowledgments. Thank you to Federico and Lisa and my Tory Banny group for letting me be a part of that and teaching me a lot. Um, the Hummingbird Gallery as well as Naomi.
Yes, yeah, very good use of the time. Open the question uh, period group. So I'm just curious if when you're at the hummingbird gallery, if you notice the way the hummingbirds ate from the feeders, did they perch or did they like hover? Like Most of them were perching that I saw. Something interesting that I noted too was that there were a lot of times where there would be a bunch of hummingbirds around the feeder and then another one would come in, usually like a violet saber wing, and would chase them all off. So there's a lot of territorial behavior around the feeders as well. Um, why did you choose one species to focus on of flowers and how did you choose that species? Yeah, so I chose this species specifically because um, because it was in high abundance in both areas and it's known to be visited by different hummingbird species. There are some flowers that have those cobalt traits that make them exclusively pollinated by one species, like the green hermit, for example. And this was meant to attract more generalist species um, and not close it off to others. Lee? Um, in terms of your methods of like being at a close area versus a far area, did you split your time for like, so like for one week, you, like every day you would go to the close area and then, you know? Yeah, I, for the visitations that I observed, I would do it every other day. Okay. Um, and I would, but for the mist netting part, there was a five day period where I was just in the Crandall Reserve mm -hmm. collecting pollen. And then we were able to collect the pollen at the gallery just one day. Got it. So, Hey. Hey. I'm just curious about if you have any like ideas of these feeders affecting the health of the hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. Like I know this might be another topic related to this, but like do you have any like Sense. ideas about that? I there is a past study that someone in this program did assessing hummingbird health at the feeders. Um, I think from my personal observations or predictions, I would think that having such a high concentration of hummingbirds in one area could lead to more disease spread, possibly, um, which could reduce their overall health. And hummingbirds naturally also feed on insects as well as nectar. And I think just having that constantly available food source could alter that slightly and maybe reduce some aspects of their health. Sam? Okay, um, I have a question about what was your favorite Ooh. I really like the magenta throated wood star because it was just really cute. <laughs> I don't remember any other time. Any other question? Oh, I have the same question um, that was already said about health at the feeders, but only because um, I know in Southern California there is an eye pathogen that's passed more frequently at the mm -hmm. feeders, and so it suggested not to have hummingbird feeders out because it causes that disease to spread rapidly, and I was going to ask if you knew of any other diseases that in Costa Rica that are affecting hummingbirds. That's, yeah, that's interesting. I don't specifically, but I know, yeah, I feel like I've heard of other ones in other time periods where people have been removing their hummingbird feeders mm -hmm. because they don't want to spread diseases. So yeah, that, that's very interesting. Muchas gracias, Raquel. Well, as you, as you can realize, realize now, we are in the most interesting session of the symposium. <laughs> Our next speaker is Brooke Borders from UC Los Angeles. sections. Um, we're going to cover a lot of bases, but we're going to start pretty simple with what are moths. Um, <laughs> moths are part of the order of insects called Lepidoptera. Um, you might have heard that earlier in Lee's presentation. Um, Lepidoptera literally means scaly wings um, because the wings have scales on them that have these colorful textures, not textures, but patterns. 
Um, and they are in the same family as butterflies. And their life history is they start as larvae, they become caterpillars, and adults. Um, but 90% of Lepidoptera are moths. Um, they're an extremely diverse group and very unappreciated in comparison to butterflies. Um, most Lepidoptera have a liquid diet of um, fruit and nectar. Um, and moths orientate their flight on fixed points of light, which is why we have this huge case of evolutionary mismatch where lots of moths show up at your house or your windows or just any bright light because your uh, lights are not far away and so they just get closer and closer until they start spiraling towards the light. Um, so coevolution. Coevolution is when two or more species affect each other's anatomy and behavior through natural selection. Um, Moths have evolved in many ways to avoid that predation, including cryptic coloring, which means they, or their scales or coloring is modified to their environment to camouflage or uh, mimic other creatures, uh, like one family of moths that in a day, which I'll be talking about more later, have uh, eye spots um, that they will open and flash for predators to make them scared. Um, as well as elongated wings, which uses acoustic predators because it makes them more unsure of where they are, as well as gives them higher chances of survival if they are attacked. Um, sound absorption, because um, they are attacked, um, use, or found using uh, ultrasonic sounds. And so they have hairy thoraxes, or their scales can absorb some of the sound, and it's harder for them to be detected. And then the one that I'll be focusing on is their ability to hear. So many moths evolve, well, most nocturnal moths, as well as other bat uh, prey, have evolved tympanic organs, which is a very simple hearing organ. Um, and it allows them to hear within around the range of 20 to 60 kilohertz. Um, and this diagram shows where um, on their body their tympanic organs are, usually at a range of where, like on the thorax. Um, and this giant, Silk moth is the Saturnid individual. Um, Saturnidae do not have tympanic organs. Um, instead, they avoid bat predation through other measures like erratic flying or flying close to the ground. Um, so the structure of bat calls, um, they have a search phase, which is a general, like, um, kind of slower um, phase of their call in which they're searching and navigating their general area. Once they start to detect prey, they switch to a faster rate of sound called the approach phase, which is where they're getting closer to their prey or navigating more cluttered areas in which they can't really tell what's going on, so they need more information to navigate the area. And we get into the feeding buzz, which is where it's so fast that it looks like a cloud when you're analyzing the sound waves. And that's when they're getting really close to the prey, and so they need as much information as they can to adapt to how the prey is going to move. Um, so what is eavesdropping? You guys are probably familiar. It's when you overhear something that you weren't supposed to. <laughs> um, as a biological phenomenon, um, an example I have is this yellow species of bird. Um, this individual has spotted a predator, and so it makes a call to its kin yellow species in order to alert them that a predator is nearby. But this blue species overhears, overhears this call and reacts to it to benefit itself. Um, in the case of moths, um, I was interested to see, since so much of their anatomy and behavior is in response to bat predation, if they have evolved um, to engage in this biological phenomenon, since um, there are moths that hear and some that don't. And so for my experiment, I was hoping to see are moths capable of eavesdropping? Um, the Saturnid individuals cannot hear, but other species can. And when they do hear a bat, typically they will engage in something called protean flight, which is where they make a dramatic and quick dive down to the ground in order to avoid an incoming bat. And if they get closer to vegetation, it makes them harder to find because the bat is relying on reflections of sound back to itself. So this is a simplified version of my methods, which I'll go into greater detail. Um, the first step was to record uh, bat calls near the estation using a special microphone. I used two different types of microphones, uh, borrowed from the University of Costa Rica. And then I built a flight cage um, to contain my caught moths. 
Um, then I set up a light, a light station outside the station to attract moths using a white light and a UV light. And then I put the collected moths into the light gauge and played the recorded back. So this is the one of the microphones that I use. Um, it's the more sophisticated one and the one that I actually got um, results from. Um, we, yeah. Uh, we had to record it manually, so I was connected to an iPad and just kind of circling my arm around trying to find where the bats were. <laughs> um, and then I used a PVC pipe um, and a lot of time to make a flight cage. <laughs> um, and I sewed it together, uh, the mesh, and then uh, this is what the light setup looks like with the white light and UV light. So, results. Um, I got five complete bat calls over three nights of recording bats, um, of which three species all are the same family and all in aerial insectivores. Um, I used the Myiotis nigricum species for my experiment, um, but unfortunately I had fewer than 20 moths each night, um, but I collected 12 individuals with a wingspan larger than 5 centimeters, um, including Bombicidae, Iribidae, Geometridae, Nocturnidae, um, Sphingidae and Saturnidae. Um, in each trial that I did, um, which I placed an individual moth within the flight cage, um, the moths perched, which is something that I didn't expect when I initially designed the study. Um, and I placed them individually, even though my original plan was to place um, a hearing moth in the Saturnidae individual to see how they reacted to the bat call. Um, I didn't find my Saturnidae individual until my fifth night of. <coughs> light station or light collection. Um, so, discussion. Um, the Myotis nigricans, and as well as the other two species that I recorded, um, are very common species, um, but they have not been, or at least by EAP students, not been recorded at the Estation before. Um, they are, the species that I use, Myotis nigricans, is very small um, and primarily feeds on moths, so it's an ideal uh, candidate for my study. Um, in terms of moth activity, um, I realized through further research that moth activity, especially at light traps, is influenced by a lot of environmental factors, including wind, <coughs> wood illuminance, and temperature. And since we're heading into the winter months here in Costa Rica, that means it's very windy and very cold. And so that all discourages moth activity. <coughs> Um, larger moths in particular are kind of battered by the wind, so they're discouraged from flying, and the cold makes them, um, it's not ideal for them to fly because it takes more energy. Um, as well as the mood illuminance, um, when they're, since they are attracted to light and they fly based on fixed points of light, when the moon is brighter, they will use that. They're more likely to use the moon as their fixed point than the light station. So that is also another factor that affects how many moths showed up to my light station. And then when the perching happened, um, perching is actually a really good defense against our aerial insectivores. Um, it's the safest place for them to be, which is just against the substrate and not moving because bats are really good at detecting movement. In fact, um, I think 97% of bats are able to catch a moth if it starts fluttering. Um, and so, it's like any movement is very um, disadvantageous. Uh, it's also potentially influenced by temperature, as some studies have shown that um, there has to be a minimum temperature for a uh, moth to initiate flight. So, some key takeaways. Um, light trap catches are influenced by environmental factors. Um, perching can be a very um, advantageous defensive behavior, and that this question requires more research. Um, this type of study has not been attempted before, um, and the, uh, so there's a lot of factors that go into it, like perching temperature, all these um, factors, and like um, uh, the visual systems of the moths also needs to be considered. Uh, moths are not very good at seeing things, um, and it's kind of pertinent for the moth to be able to see another moth uh, complete the protein flight in order to react. Um, some studies have used um, string or wax and wire to make sure that their moths are not able to perch and slight when we were trying to test the reactions to bat calls. Um, but I feel like that might 
be a huge factor in how their behavior is, or like a big influence on how they react to that pulse or how they move. So I feel like we need to do more research on what motivates moths to fly rather than perch. Um, this is all I have to say, but special thanks to my homestead family, Syria and Alvaro, um, Adriana Arias, who taught me how to use the equipment about bat acoustics, Bernard Rodriguez, who loaned me this equipment, Betty, Naomi, Frank, and my wonderful and kind peers.
Some background information, um, Costa Rica has one of the most highly concentrated road networks in the entire world. Um, and one study showed that 600 kilometers of national highways were, I were identified as high risk to local wildlife. The presence of roads leads to uh, fragmented forests, and this poses a big threat to arboreal animals in particular, because it prevents them from successfully crossing these forest clearings. Um, there's been increases in roadkill, increases in probability of extinctions, and a decrease in genetic flow with the presence of roads and its caused forest fragmentation. Artificial canopy bridges, also known as ACBs, are a potential solution to this forest fragmentation. Um, this is because they provide a safe route for the animals to cross the clearings. Um, they've been shown to decrease levels of roadkill. One study in particular, um, which was performed at Hacienda Baru Wildlife Crossings here in Costa Rica, found a 40% mitigation of the load kill due to the presence of ACVs. Um, there are three main types of artificial canopy bridges. Um, the single rope bridge is down here on the bottom right, double rope bridge is at the top, and ladder style bridges are at the bottom left. So knowing all of this, um, it prompted me to ask the question, what species are using the artificial canopy bridges here in Monteverde? Costa Rica, and um, out of the bridges that I studied, which bridge type and location were most frequently used by the local wildlife. In order to do this, um, I got to climb trees, which was one of the most fun parts of my project. Shout out to Rafi at Vargas and Izzy Moore. Izzy's back there. Rafi can't be here today. Um, we installed camera traps in five different canopy bridges here in Monteverde. One of these was a natural canopy bridge in San Luis, which is basically uh, an area in which trees meet over a clearing. Um, and then four of the bridges were artificial canopy bridges, one of which was in San Luis and the other in Monteverde. Um, this was a 12-day study. The cameras were up in the trees for a total of 12 days. And on day seven, I replaced the SD cards. Um, and after camera collection, I looked at the camera trap data and identified the species present in the wildlife bridges. Um, here are the bridge locations. The natural canopy bridge at Finca El Jardin, artificial canopy bridge at La Trocha in San Luis, which was in the latter style, another artificial canopy bridge at the Monteverde Friends School, also a ladder bridge. Artificial canopy bridge at Cafe Monteverde. This was a single cable bridge. And an artificial canopy bridge at Renario and Santa Elena, which was also in a ladder style. Here's a map uh, displaying the different bridges that I studied, starting at the bottom in San Luis, that was camera one, all the way up to camera seven and eight at Renario and Santa Elena. Um, here's a big table of all of my results. Um, in total, I saw 11 different species using the wildlife bridges, with a total of 32 individuals and 52 wildlife bridge crossings. 64% um, of the species using these bridges were nocturnal species. There were two um, unidentifiable species because of the um, photo quality and lighting. Um, the variegated squirrel was the most commonly seen species using all of the canopy bridges. And the ladder style bridge at the Monteverde Friends School was the most used bridge out of all of the ones I studied. Here is my results in graphical form. Um, on the x-axis is the uh, name of the species seen. Y-axis is the number of individuals. Um, as you can see, the variegated squirrel was the most frequently seen species, um, shown, which was shown in all three of the artificial canopy bridges. Um, and each color bar represents um, a location, different bridge location, and so the frequency of the yellow bars, you can see, is because of the amount of species that were shown at the Monteverde School Bridge. Um, here are some photos of um, some of the camera trap photos. This is a variegated squirrel. This guy was really interested in the camera and on several occasions got up real close to it checking it out. Um, this is a variegated squirrel. It's diurnal. Uh, it was the most frequently seen species. 
and it was present in every artificial canopy bridge I observed. This is a Mexican tree porcupine, a nocturnal species, and it was seen in only one bridge. That was the Mario and Santa Elena. Um, this one's a little hard to see. It's a kinkajou, also nocturnal. It's eating something, probably fruit, in this image. Um, it was only seen in one bridge, and that was the Monteverde Friends School. Here's a common opossum, uh, also nocturnal, and the common opossum was seen in two bridges, both at Lenario and Monteverde Friends School. Um, so my results from the study were consistent with previous studies performed in Costa Rica on artificial canopy bridges. These studies also found the kinkajou, Mexican tree porcupine, common opossum, and variegated squirrels as the most frequently seen species using the bridges. Um, after getting these results, I was kind of questioning why a lot of the species I was seeing were species of least concern um, when, in my mind, I thought the bridges were being built to support more endangered species. So I then asked the question, where are the primates, sloths, and anteaters? Um, this is important because the four species of monkeys here in Costa Rica, their populations have decreased anywhere from 43 to 72% since 1995. Um, the giant anteater is now extinct in Costa Rica, and habitat destruction um, just continues as the human populations grow and tourism um, is still important. So um, I noticed that some of the bridges I studied here in Monte Verde were in poor condition, and most of these bridges were in the ladder bridge style, although previous studies have shown that primates prefer the double rope bridge type. So how do we move forward and bridge the gap? Um, future artificial canopy bridge construction should um, try to target endangered species, and this could look like constructing more bridges in the double rope style. Um, this could look like using natural substrates for the bridges, such as bamboo, instead of ropes or cables. Um, it's important that the bridges are installed between patches of continuous forest, because this is where um, the most amount of species will be found. And avoiding installing the bridges in isolated trees is also important because um, if a tree is isolated, that's a barrier that animals have to cross to even reach the bridge in the first place. Also looking for areas where roadkill is already high um, would be a good idea to start um, looking at new locations for bridges. A special thanks to Federico Chinchilla for his never-ending support, his humor, and his love for coffee. <laughs> Another special thanks to Rafi Vargas and Izzy Moore for their climbing leadership and knowledge, respect and passion for nature, and insatiable drive for adventure. Thank you. Okay, we open question. Isabel, 
Um, so I think that the bridges come in handy the most when um, where traffic is the highest, and so um, that could either be at the Friends School, Cafe Monteverde, or Renario. Um, but the Friends School does have a lot of traffic, and I notice um, in my camera trap analysis, I had to sift through a lot of photos because cars were triggering the camera traps. So um, it could be because those roads are so highly trafficked, animals are forced to cross using the bridge to avoid um, being killed. Yeah. Okay. Um, what were you most surprised to see, I guess? Um, surprised? I was most surprised that squirrels were the most like frequently seen species. I was excited to see the porcupine uh, because I had never seen a porcupine before, I don't think. Um, and it was also interesting because um, I think it was the same individual that was returning to the bridge um, several nights out of my study. And I learned that they do return to the same trees um, for nesting purposes. So it could be the same individual that kept popping up. Izzy. <laughs> Did you see any crossings on the natural canopy bridge on the farm? Yes, there was one um, one crossing at the natural canopy bridge, and that was a quaddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the blue? What's the blue there? Uh, the blue is the Santa Elena bridge. So yellow is Fred School, green is Cafe Monteverde, red is San Luis uh, Natural Bridge, and blue is Santa Elena. Romario. Me? Okay. If you hypothetically had the ability to change the way that you did this uh, project, meaning like, I know that you went out on the seventh day, if you could go out as much as you wanted, would you have, or would you have to switch it around? If I could do what I wanted, um, I ideally would have built bridges here. Um, I did a lot of research before and um, a lot of previous studies have found that the double rope canopy bridges are highly used by primates because um, they'll put their feet on one and hands on the other as they're moving. Um, and also after the first installation date, the double rope bridges are used more quickly by wildlife than the ladder bridges because there's just less like new material for the species to get used to. Um, so ideally, I would have loved to like build a few and see which one was the most effective. Cool. Mark and then Frank. Uh, would you have considered using like natural material to kind of like nail it with a natural bridge, and would you think that that would get more traction than a double ladder bridge? Or yeah. Um, so in a few other studies, bamboo was frequently used um, by the researchers when they were building new bridges. And um, those were used most quickly after installation because it's a material that wildlife is already used to. But uh, an issue that they found is that they uh, broke down faster because um, obviously it's, it's a natural material. And so when exposed to all the elements, um, it was quicker to break down. So there's the downside of that. But also if it's replaced and taken good care of, it could be a really good option. Do you have a brief question? Uh, just a quick one. Did you say a quick question? No, it's long. Okay, so please make it. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so this is kind of random, but uh, you thought about this a lot and been hanging out with people who know a lot about it. Um, I'm wondering if you considered uh, also coupling the Canopy Bridge campaign with like uh, slowing down traffic as well. Um, and yeah. If that, if that might also have a major impact on reducing road kills. Totally. Um, at all of the canopy bridges installed here in Monteverde, they have signs um, that are below the bridges. It was in a couple of my slides that just say caution um, fauna crossings. And so I think, yeah, more of those signs and just more awareness overall um, that roadkill is a problem could be equally as beneficial as installing more bridges. Gracias, <clears throat> Frank. <clears throat> Something that Rachel didn't know 
is that monkeys were not really hungry because Alex, next speaker, was around. I was taking all the monkeys. So from you see Santa Barbara, please welcome uh, her talk. and Kawadis. First, I'm going to give a little bit of background on Kawadis. I know we've all seen them. They probably all approached us, tried to take some of our food. And that's kind of what I'm going to be looking at today. Um, so their scientific name is Nasua Narica, and they are, again, a very common animal in Costa Rica. And so they both live in groups and in, by themselves individually. When they're growing up, they all live in a group together, but then as the males mature, the males live by themselves individually and the females continue to live in groups. Um, they have an extensive ability to problem solve and learn the best way to get food. And they actually rely mainly on their sense of smell and they have, you know, the really big nose <laughs> in order to find food and locate it. Now a little bit of background on white-faced capuchins. Their scientific name is Cebus imitator. Um, they live in troops, typically consisting of about 10 to 20 members with a social hierarchy. So they have an alpha male and they actually have friends within the group, which is kind of cute. Um, they are extremely intelligent and have been long studied due to their ability to learn new things. And um, that's what I'm going to be looking at today. So for my study, I've defined learning as the adaptive modification of behavior based on experience. So that means there has to be an actual change in behavior in order for learning to have been occurring. Um, White-faced capuchins typically cling to their mother's backs and stomachs for about five months after they're born. And they learn everything from their moms, um, what food to eat, um, where to forage, stuff like that. And it goes to say that a lot of their learning is actually observational, so they watch their mom eat food and they learn the best way for them to actually do it. This is a picture of a capuchin at my study site. Um, so now a little bit of comparing and contrasting qualities and capuchins. Um, they are both extremely agile and they nest in trees. Um, they are potential competitors for food as they're both generalized omnivores. So they typically eat insects and fruits. Like this ficus tree over here, both kawadis and capuchins would love to be up in there. Um, they also prey on each other's juveniles, um, so they go and do nest raids. Um, and then studies have previously shown that both capuchins and kawadis can have a learning color association. So that means that they're able to associate a particular color with a stimuli. So in my case, green and salt. Okay, so this led me to my question, do Kawadis and Capuchins learn to associate color and food in a novel environment? And specifically, I'm going to be looking at their learning style, so if they're learning the stimuli based off of observational learning, or they actually have to interact and like directly smell the stimuli. Um, I did this by setting out food for a week. So I chose Frank's office for a study site, and I came there every day in the morning between 8.30 and 9.30, and I set out both, at the beginning, both whole eggs and raw eggs, and then three whole bananas and three sliced bananas. During this um, first week period, it was just kind of to get the animals to associate the study site with food, and during this time, I conducted observations, and I actually was able to distinguish between the capuchins and identify them, and this is really important for actually knowing which individuals have interacted with my study for the observational learning aspect. After the first week, I actually started another study site um, because there weren't a lot of capuchins at the first study site. Um, so I picked another site in Bajo del Tigre, and I set out bananas, and at both sites, I sliced them which you can see here, kind of small, but those are sliced bananas, and I dyed them both purple and green, and this was in order to determine if the animals had an initial color preference for either the green or the purple sliced bananas. This is important to see if there's like a change in behavior for the actual learning to occur. So after two days of that, I then added a lot of salt 
to um, only the green banana slices, and I again observed the resulting change in behavior to see if they still liked the green ones or if they didn't, and so on. And then after three days of that, I took away the salt from the green bananas, but I still sliced the bananas and left out both green and purple ones. And then I observed the resulting change in behavior of which slices they ate. So now onto the results. So this um, first graph is showing Kawadi like appearance over time at Frank's office study site. So on the x-axis we have days, and on the y-axis we have Kawadi occurrence, or how often they're actually at my study site. As you can see, this is a lovely positive <laughs> upward graph, um, showing that they frequented the study site more as the days kept progressing, and that they learned that the site was actually a consistent supply of food. <laughs> um, these graphs show um, Kawadi did actually learn to associate the color green with salt. So in the top left graph, um, it shows the remaining green bananas over time. So when I arrived back at the study site in the morning, which green bananas were still there. Um, no salt is in blue, so these are the days that I did not add salt to the green bananas. And orange are the days that I did add salt to the bananas. So the only days that green bananas were actually remaining were the times that I added salt. And then the graph on the bottom right shows um, Kawadi color preference over time. And this is the amount of time, so on the y-axis we have the amount of purple slices chosen over green ones. And then on the x-axis we have the days. Um, so purple chosen over green is when a Kawadi actually picked a purple one over a green one that was closer and did not ever actually interact with the green one, just moved on past it. And as you can see, um, this also had a positive co co correlation. So the Kawadis learned to prefer the color purple over green as time progressed. And also something important to note about this graph is that the very last day, December 3rd, I did not add any salt to the green bananas. However, the Kawadis still ate all the purple ones before they even interacted with the green ones, showing that they were still associating the color green with salt, even though it was no longer there. Um, this graph shows the um, initial reaction to salty green bananas in both white-faced capuchins and individual Kawadis. And this is the amount of times they were smelling the green bananas. And as you can see, the Kawadis actually had to smell the green bananas a lot more than the capuchins. Um, the capuchins just kind of picked it up, smelled it once, and put it away and kind of generalized that idea. So the significance is that Kawadis you smell more than capuchins. And this is the initial time taken to approach new food with white-faced capuchins and individual Kawadis. And as you can see, white-faced capuchins took a much longer time to initially appro approach the new food in the new environment. They took 14 minutes, while the Kawadis only took about one and a half minutes. So they're much more cautious. Now this is a great graph. This shows the observational learning of white-faced capuchins that I observed. On the y-axis, we have the time taken to grab a banana in a novel situation, and on the x-axis are individual white-faced capuchins. Um, so for the first capuchin, it took them about 14 minutes to grab a banana. They were looking around, making sure the environment was okay. And then after that first capuchin grabbed it, it took only a minute for the next capuchin to go and grab a banana, and then after that, only 30 seconds for the next capuchin to go grab a banana. And this is really cool because it shows the capuchins were learning from each other and they got faster at grabbing the bananas after they watched each other have success. Um, so now kind of to bring it back to my central question, do Kawadis and capuchins learn to associate color and food in a novel environment? And we saw that yes, Kawadis did learn to associate um, green with the color salt, even when the salt was no longer present in the green bananas. And the, I only added salt for three days to the green bananas, and the Kawadis did adapt to this change, which shows how quickly Kawadis can adapt to changes. And this is really important because the change was in the food, and animals have to really be aware of the food they're eating and be aware of like the signals and signs of whether food is ripe, unripe, whether it's going to make them sick or not. And so it's really important they're able to adapt quickly to that change. And it showed, my study showed, yes, they do. Um, and then also my study showed that Kawadis depended on sense of smell, while capuchins depended mostly on their sense of sight through the observational learning. And also capuchins were much more cautious 
again, and they were learning about their environment from each other, again, showing observational learning. Um, I have some fun pictures up here. The top right picture is of a quad actually spitting out a green banana. Oh. <laughs> and then on the bottom right is a capuchin just smelling it, and I have a new video from my camera traps um, of the capuchins actually eating any of the green bananas. They were just smelling them. Um, yeah, thank you. Ooh.
Um, so flying in Cite, I was very grateful to have the opportunity to study here. Um, it's a unique location located in the northwestern uh, portion of Costa Rica on the Pacific coast. Um, and it's located within the area de conservación Guanacaste. Um, and it's characterized by mangroves, estuaries, uh, and primarily dry forest along the coast. Um, the beach itself is 1,050 meters long, so it's relatively short. Um, that is a drone picture of Nancite that I took. Um, and because the area is protected by the ACG, um, there is pretty limited human access there, um, and it's quite remote, so getting out there yourself is um, difficult, um, which means it was an interesting study site because um, predators have pretty much free range without the um, impact of human civilization or um, presence. And Plainancite was of particular interest to me because it is a nesting site for all of Ridley sea turtles. Um, and in particular, it is one of only a few beaches in, around the world that um, has Arribada events. And Arribada events are basically mass synchronized nesting in which hundreds um, and thousands of all over these sea turtles um, mass at the same time um, over the span of a few nights and lay their eggs. Um, and it's only performed by Olive Ridley sea turtles and Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, so those are the only two species that have this behavior. I mean, the idea is actually um, to overwhelm predators. There's um, this concept called the predator sati satiation hypothesis, um, which basically states that when you have extremely large groups of prey, um, predators are overwhelmed and cannot eat them all at one time or um, get full before um, they can continue on to the next meal. Um, and once these turtles get to the beach, they perform the nesting process, which takes about 45 minutes. Um, the first step is they stick their head in the sand and scope around for an ideal spot to nest, um, which oftentimes is past the tide and up near the vegetation um, along the forest edge. And once they find a spot, they dig a hole using their back two flippers, it's about a half a meter deep, and lay their eggs. Um, and the clutch size is about 100 eggs. Um, and once those eggs are laid, it takes about 45 days for them to incubate before the hatchlings break out from the shells. Um, and a little bit more about the hatching dynamics. So these were hatchlings from Nancite. All these pictures were taken at Nancite. Um, the hatchling rates at Nancite are considerably lower than other areas. Um, so in 2007, they were recorded at 17% and 26% um, in two different parts of the nesting season. And um, they have um, gone up from that point. But um, so for example, I witnessed some nests um, that would have 60 to 70 hatchlings out of the total clutch of 100, um, so much higher hatching rate. But, the reason that Nancite in the past has had some lower hatching rates is because of the microbial composition of the sand. Um, so turtle hatchlings are very dependent on this microbial composition, and the composition of fungi and bacteria within the sand depends on the organic matter that is in the area. So if there are Arribata events in which a lot of turtles come in at the same time and dig up other nests, there's a lot more organic matter, um, and it uh, creates a more favorable environment for my microbes, um, which can impact the hatching rate. And so once they hatch, um, they ideally hatch. At, they all hatch at the same time, uh, but they wait for each other um, and did use sensory detection to figure out when everyone is ready to go, um, and all migrate out to the ocean at the same time to once again overwhelm predators. So learning this about Mancite and the dynamics there, I wanted to ask a couple questions. One of them, how does the hatchling survival rate vary during the day versus at night? Um, and then what predators are present during these hatching events? Um, what are their behaviors? How many are eaten by certain predators? And um, what are those differences? And then 
how does predator composition and behavior vary um, throughout the day and night when there are not hatchlings present? Like, are they waiting for hatching events to happen? Are they looking for other food? Um, things like that. And then an additional question is, it, while I was there, I was looking at, are there any events of predation on adult um, all of the turtles? Because I wanted to see basically how the population as a whole is impacted um, by predators. So my methods, I completed train cycle walks up and down the beach. Um, and I went out in the morning, early morning, um, late morning, late afternoon, early evening, and throughout the night. So I was at the beach for many, many hours. Um, I would identify a hatching event by either spotting a hatchling sea turtle myself or using the cue of birds that were preying on them in the distance and immediately rushed to the event. Um, I counted the number of turtles that I observed initially um, and then kept track of the tide, noted the, the nest distance from vegetation, and then really focused on predator behavior and how many hatchlings were eaten by predators and how many made it to the water. Um, and then in terms of predator observations in general, anytime that I was at the beach and there were no hatchlings present, I logged the activity um, number of predators, predator composition, and basically logged what they were doing while there were no hatchlings present. And in terms of the predation of adults, um, there were a few circumstances that were witnessed and um, whenever we found the corpse of an adult turtle, we would set up camera traps around it to observe the returning predator. So the primary result to answer the first question of hatchling survivorship during the day versus at night, um, I observed 13 different hatching events and those were at different stages. So sometimes I witnessed the whole event in which um, 60 or 70 turtles would pop out of the nest and make it to the water. And other times I would witness um, a portion of the event, so I'd only see maybe the last 13 as they make it to the water. Um, and regardless, I would note how many of the total I saw survived. Um, so you can see here, it's clearly demonstrated that hatchlings that come out of the nest and crawl towards the water after around 5 p.m., which is around sunset, have a much higher survival rate through the night. And any hatchlings that um, attempt to crawl to the ocean during the day had almost a 0% survivorship proportion. Um, and so survivorship proportion on the left here, the y-axis, is basically the number of surviving turtles out of the total that I counted. Um, and I only saw one turtle hatchling um, make it to the water when it was significantly light out. Um, and that was because of a couple of different predator behaviors. And then some of the variables that I measured, including tide, distance, nest distance from vegetation, um, and group size did not have significant correlations to survivorship. Um, so even if there was a larger group of turtles, if I watched 60 crawl to the water, it really depended on whether it was during the day or at night um, to determine how many survived because there were groups of 60 that passed during the day um, and all 60 were eaten <laughs> relatively quickly. So these were the main predators that I observed eating hatchlings. During the day, the two um, primary predators were the magnificent frigate bird and the black vulture. Um, and at night, the gulf ghost crab and yellow crowned night heron were um, the primary predators with hatchlings. And then during the day, there were two secondary predators that I noted um, eating hatchlings on one or two occasions, which were the crested caracara and black iguana. Um, and both of those were also present on the beach at other times of the day. Um, this graph is a little bit complicated to look at initially, but it's very important because it demonstrates um, the correlation between predators present um, and survivorship. So on the x-axis, you have all 13 of the hatching events that I witnessed, um, and they are marked with a little icon, whether they were during the day or at night. Um, and for each of those events, you have the composition of predators um, and number of predators present. So during the day, the red and gray colors indicate frigate birds and black vultures. Those were the two main predators that I witnessed during the day. Um, and they were in relatively high numbers. Um, and then the predators at night were the night herons and ghost crabs. Um, and then if you look above each bar, there's a point that indicates the survivorship proportion, which is on the y-axis on the right-hand side. 
Um, and you can see that predation or predation during hatching events at night um, from night herons and ghost crabs resulted in a much higher survivorship proportion. And predation during the day, where frigates and vultures were the primary predators, had much lower, um, uh, zero, almost zero um, survivorship. And then there were two exceptions on here. Um, this one here and this one here were events that occurred at sunset. So in this first one, frigates were present for a short portion of time during the hatching event and actually left when the sun started to go down. Um, and night herons came in and transitioned to um, that predator type. And so you see a much higher survival rate because the frigates were only eating hatchlings for a short period of time before leaving. Um, and the same thing with the other one, except vultures were present for a short time um, before night herons were the primary predator. So this is the activity of predators in the absence of hatchlings. So when I was at the beach, um, I counted the number of frigate birds, the number of vultures that I saw, and, um, and the important part to look at here is the peaks of activity and the colors in which they um, share similarities. So this is over the span of about seven or eight days of no activity of hatchlings. And you can see that the um, black and red curves are frigate birds and vultures, and they peak at the same time during the day. And then when their activity ceases, the um, night heron blue and ghost crab yellow activity peaks at night, um, just for a little bit more visualization there. And so I came up with some of these predator diagrams to show you kind of where on the beach these predators are located. Um, and this is a drone shot facing down, and that was a, a pretty um, consistent nesting or hatching area. So the hatchlings would come from these trees and crawl in a line that kind of spans out towards the water. Um, and frigate birds initially would be soaring over the ocean and over the beach, kind of scouring the beach for hatching activity. And vultures tended to be perched in trees and would kind of scout out around the trees um, when they found activity. And all of the birds would cluster in the same area when, once hatchlings emerged. Um, this was kind of a unique behavior that I witnessed. Hatch, um, frigate birds, once hatchlings started emerging, would form this cycle um, where they would um, take turns swooping down and grabbing hatchlings. Um, and there was kind of a sense of order in which they followed the bird in front of them. And um, they continued to do that um, until all the hatchlings were eaten um, and did not show any signs of competition between the birds themselves. So they actually allowed the one in front of them to grab a hatchling and sort of took turns. Um, and this is just the alignment of the night predators. So night herons position themselves almost territorially along the um, water's edge and had designated sections where if there were hatchlings coming down, that was their area. Um, and ghost crabs stayed at the interface between dry and wet sand and would kind of patrol, come out of their holes looking for hatchlings. Um, short graphic warning on the next slide, if you're not interested in blood or anything, take a look away. This is the, um, a predation event of an, a jaguar on an adult Olive Ridley sea turtle, so this is the corpse. Um, you can see the, this was during the Arribada I witnessed, so um, the jaguar will sometimes kill a turtle on the beach. Um, and they usually aim for the head first um, and then leave and come back the following night to um, eat the corpse. Um, and I was also told by the researchers there that sometimes during an Arribada they just kill turtles for fun because there are so many and it's just a stimulus that they are interested in. Um, but in this case, we had camera traps set up at the corpse and witnessed two jaguars coming back the following night to feed on the corpse. Um, I think they actually came back two nights um, following the initial kill. Um, and so I, I actually observed four different adult Oliver Lee turtles that were killed by jaguars while I was there. And each time um, the research I was with would drag the corpse into the forest um, shortly, like a uh, short distance from the kill site, set up camera traps in the trees, and then the following night, the jaguars would come back and eat the adult turtle. Sorry if I'm taking a bit more time, but um, 
In conclusion, um, the daytime hatching percentage was actually a lot higher at Nancite than other studies have shown. So I had um, a night emergence rate of about 38%. I saw five out of 13 um, hatching events at night, which a lot of other studies have seen rates, night emergence rates of about 93% um, in that range, um, and for other species of turtles as well. So I think it would be important to look at maybe my sample size or figure out if Nancite has a higher emergence during the day versus at night compared to other beaches. Um, and then just dynamics of the predator satiation effect, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so it works both ways with an Arivata because if you have um, 70,000 turtles nesting in the same span of three nights, that means that 45 days later you have a whole lot of hatchlings coming out at the same time. Um, the and so it works on several levels too because with an individual nest, the hatchlings all leave at the same time, which is intended to overwhelm predators. But in my observations, that did not work at all during the day. It didn't matter if there were 13 or 80 hatchlings, the frigate birds could scoop them up all at once um, and demolish the whole nest. Um, but during the night, it, it might be a feasible option to hatch all at the same time because um, predators like night herons and um, ghost crabs are much, uh, eat much less hatchlings than predators like frigate birds and vultures. Um, and so um, it's possible that Arivada hatchlings are intended, because they all hatch at the same time, to overwhelm predators, but that solitary hatching events um, do not have that effect. Um, and then the frigate bird behavior that I observed, the cycling behavior, I was not able to find in other literature sources. Um, so it's possible that that is a unique behavior um, to Nancite or to some of these Arivada beaches where there's solitary hatching events. Um, and definitely would suggest that um, future studies can continue to observe predator behavior. Um, and yes, jaguar presence was uh, studied by another researcher at the beach um, who made the argument that their presence as apex predators actually discourages other nest predators like coyotes, raccoons, and opossums and helps the olive ridley population as a whole um, because in their absence, those nest predators do a lot more damage to populations by eating eggs. So that, that was interesting to note. And then just the last little wrap up about conservation implications of this. Um, I had a lot of questions about where conservationists should intervene um, because during hatching events, I think at night, hatchlings are fine on their own. Um, predators only account for two to three hatchling mortalities out of a total um, nesting group, which I think um, should be allowed to continue because um, it's also, like hatchlings serve as a, an important food source for some of these predators. Um, but I think that the mortality that I witnessed during the day was significant enough to um, kind of spur future studies and experiments maybe with predator exclusion um, to see if you can find ways to allow hatchlings to get to the water um, and maintain these population levels considering the um, vulnerable status of all of these turtles. Um, so definitely would recommend future studies to look at that. And I think the way that you go about those studies is important because some people at the beach I was working at would take the hatchlings in buckets and carry them to the water, um, which has been shown in studies that might be an issue because hatchlings imprint on their um, local beaches using chemical and physical cues, so that walk to the water could actually be a very important stage for them. Um, so one idea for doing a predator exclusion experiment would be um, set up netting that prevents birds and gives kind of the hatchlings a channel to make it to the water um, and also allow them to imprint on their beach to return to nest later. Um, that was quite long, so thank you for hanging out with me. Um, I really appreciate the help of the other researchers, the ACG, for um, permission to go to the site. It was a really awesome opportunity that I'm grateful for. Um, Luis Fonseca, Carolina, and Wilbert, who work there pretty consistently, um, were excellent in helping me get accustomed to the area, um, keeping me alive, and um, helping with my project. And then Frank and Federico for giving me some advice while I was there and what to study. Thank you.
time for questions, I'm sorry. Um, so we will proceed for the closing remarks. But the, the nice I uh, knew is that Granny is going to be around, I guess, just spend 24 more hours around. So you can stay with him. <laughs> I'm going to steal some time from Frank here. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you to those who came to the presentations. Thank you especially to those who gave the presentations. Thank you to the staff here um, at the Institute who work on this program. And thank you to the staff in California as well. Um, there's lots that goes on behind the scenes before you all get here and many people involved and I want to acknowledge them. And thanks to families and friends who are following along online. Uh, I've learned so much today. I had to duck out for a minute, unfortunately, but wow, you all have contributed to our understanding and appreciation of this beautiful planet that we are so fortunate to live on. And thank you for that. Um, I hope you continue doing that. And I wanna say, I love the balance I see here between you doing really rigorous independent research, of course, with support and guidance from the staff here. But uh, from my small data set of an observational study of your vocalizations today, I would say that you really are a team too. Um, it seems like you really supported each other and I hope you maintain those connections um, that you formed among you as students um, and with people who are gonna stay on the ground here in Monteverde. And you are part of the Monteverde Institute family now, so please come back and visit us. Uh, and good luck with the home stretch of this program. And again, gracias. That's it. Uh, am I supposed to be in here? Yes. Okay. Uh, so before any members of the audience leave, I would like to explicitly thank you, especially um, folks who didn't have to be here, um, the tree climbers, um, David, um, Ladio, lots, lots of people, um, David, Spanish teacher. Um, super thanks um, for um, being here with it. The symposium um, would be sort of an internal thing. Silvio, I hope you learned lots today. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, having a, a, an attentive, awesome audience uh, really makes it an event, so thank you. Um, the other thing just to mention before we get into other details is that with respect to the logistics, um, I think you can either walk or take a taxi to get back to the station. Um, I would probably recommend recharging rather than um, maybe studying for the third practical, which will be... What? <laughs> you can get drinks at the station. While we start the So, yeah, we'll, the, we'll be at the station tomorrow to help you with final submissions, and JP will be, will you be at the station all day tomorrow to help with films? Okay, muy bien. The other very important thing is, is that I will send you a prompt asking you two things. What, what Spanish section are you in? And then also, what is your status with, with respect to nature filmmaking? Okay, so please check email, um, and that'll be tonight. Okay, so if you want to um, be officially registered or not registered for a particular course, you'll need to um, help me with that. Yes? Just when you say Spanish section, do you mean just the name or teacher? Uh, that, that's enough, yeah. Okay. Some, some people have a reason to be in advanced Spanish. Oh, some people are fine with Spanish for biologists, and some people are in Spanish for maybe native speakers. Yeah. Okay. None of the advanced Spanish students, meaning Ava, Rachel, and I chose that because the description wasn't what we did. Yeah, we just didn't know. Okay, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Maybe. Um, just as also as a reminder, um, it was 10 weeks ago today when we were meeting each other in San Jose at the Hotel Cut. And, um, it's, always, it's always kind of a thing um, to look at everybody and see hmm, how this is going to go. Um, it's not a sure thing um, by any means. Um, so 
It's uh, <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second, but this is the time in the program where we start to sort of assess and, um, and say thanks and so forth. Um, so uh, we'll sort of move along because I know some of you are under a sleep debt um, and probably would like to crash, but I would very much like to thank the Monteverdi Institute, the Estación, um, the Conservation League, the ACG, um, folks in Guajini Keel, um, with respect to institute staff, um, or former institute staff, I would especially like to call out and thank Joyce Leighton, who has been translating all day. <laughs> Also to Irene, who has been broadcasting this. Don't take it for granted. It's been working quite well. To get this <laughs> and also other um, members of the Institute who have attended most of the symposium, um, Fern and Alexandra, thank you for not just attending, but everything that the Institute does to make this happen. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I just I coined a new term that I'm very happy about. Um, it's new for me, at least, called, and Fern alluded to it, this web of support. So <clears throat> I would like to um, just mention quickly um, some of the folks who helped make um, your projects go. This was an unusual program in the sense that we seem to um, call upon experts in their field and helpers and doers of things um, perhaps more than um, we have in the past. And those folks include um, Luisa Moreno, Eladio, um, where's Leo? Leo. <laughs> Le Leo is the person who helped in Guajini Kiel. Um, he spent way more time with people on boats, really did a fantastic job. Um, I don't know, he's, he's super energetic, just bouncing around, really amazing. Um, there are Adriana, who helped um, we helped Brooke um, and lots of other people. Um, Rafi and Izzy. Yeah, um, Rafi and Izzy, thank you. Um, JP had uh, all kinds of help and input with respect to films that you, we will be seeing soon. Um, and also, um, People who are constantly present, um, constantly helping, um, Federico and Naomi. Um, really, really um, appreciate your um, constant help and setting a high bar. And um, this has really been a very, very impressive display of of your hard work. So the next um, folks to thank would be you, the students. Um, thank you for applying. Thank you for getting here. Thank you for surviving all the way through without um, anything especially bad or more bad than what already happened to you. Um, just, also as a, just also as a reminder, um, you've done many um, presentations, including um, a presentation in the CACs, Pitilla, Santa Rosa, Guajini Quil, Monteverde, San Gerardo, and today. And I think, as we promised, um, this would be sort of the culmination um, of your work, your dedication, and just um, full in full in vega, full delivery. Um, it's really very gratifying to see young people put their whole effort into their projects, which you have done. Um, I can say for uh, myself, I won't speak for other folks in the room, but I remember very well the project that I did as a senior in 1980, and every student who presented today far exceeded, far exceeded what I did as an undergraduate. Leo's laughing. I'm not sure why he thinks that's funny. Um, so, uh, Frank, yes. I also wanted to say thanks because you all sent me the summaries to Naomi and thanks to Naomi for helping me out with those. Those summaries were so helpful. So, I know it was extra work, but thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, yeah.
Federico is um, responsible for remembering things and reminding me. Um, I help remind Naomi, but Naomi is the person who actually does stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked me today if I was nervous. Um, who was that? Was, who asked me, was, was it you? Yes, was I nervous? And I think my response was, if we summed up all your nervousness and put it in a bucket, mine would be many times more nervous than everyone's together. Mostly, well, simply because don't know how it's going to go, uh, sort of take on um, your excitement and anxiety and nervousness. But I can say that um, we as a group, um, the people responsible in this web of support are really delighted with your work. Um, thank you for contributing. Thank you for your full entrega. Um, that means like full delivery. Um, persevering. We know it's not easy. It, all kinds of things. The field work was challenging. Um, the analysis is challenging. There's challenges with computers and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, it was really, really an impressive um, effort. Um, yeah, so we're proud of you. For some of you, this will be your last research um, effort. Um, you may have learned that this is it. I don't need to do this anymore. And for some of you, um, it may be the continuation or the beginning of a lot of research. But at the very least, you'll understand uh, one way to gather information um, and understand the world. And um, that's a really, really um, awesome accomplishment. Thank you. Now I'm going to start my plenary talk, which will be two hours. <laughs> you forgot to say thanks to Santi for sitting through every <laughs> <laughs> you Raise your hands if you want to ride up to the station. <laughs>